I am Jester Boris with I Want to Be a GM, and this is Through the Realms, Greyhawk. Joining me today, I'm Troy the Planescape Guy. Still Mr. Producer, still have a body. I need to just hit the square button like 11 times. <laughs> Metal Gear style, we'll get rid of him. <laughs> but He'll never Greyhawk. find me in my cardboard box. Oh man, cardboard box. So, <laughs> distractions aside, Greyhawk is one of the original settings to Dungeons & Dragons, developed by Gary Gygax as he put the whole world setting, the whole Dungeons & Dragons thing together in the early 70s uh, with official releases and support all the way through 2008. Hey, everybody, sorry about that. The, uh, the first world yeah. setting actually came out in the white box set in 72, 74 of Blackmore, and it was done by one of the other writers at the, at the time, and then Gary uh, started doing some of his stuff at home, and things kind of took off after Castle Greyhawk in his basement, and uh, with 20 players a day playing in his basement. That was seven seven times a week. Seven times a week. 20 seven, players. No, it was seven or more times a week. So yeah. Seven or more times a week with 12 to 20 players. Yeah. yeah. Originally, like um, they, you, particularly when you talk about the, the development of the world of Greyhawk, we we're talking about the development of Dungeons and Dragons uh, role playing as we know it, growing out of miniature war games like uh, Chainmail and others. And. Um, you know, there's there's a lot that went into developing the world setting of Greyhawk as a backdrop for this role play uh, game that was sort of um, starting to be fleshed out and developed. Um, we're really you're going to see a lot of that early development sort of reflect in the world setting, but you're also going to see a lot of what D and D has become grow out of what we came to know and love for Greyhawk. So uh, Greyhawk being the first world setting. Uh, began in 1972 oh, after being published associated with Dungeons and Dragons up through 2008. The world itself started as a simple dungeon under a castle designed by Gary Gygax for the amusement of his children and friends. It was rapidly expanded to include not only a complex multi layer dungeon environment, but also the nearby city of Greyhawk and eventually an entire world. So this development was definitely um, an organic style of world building. So as we've been talking about world building this year, as we go through the realms, uh, this would be where you started a location and sort of uh, develop in rings outward until you end up with a whole world setting. Um, the inclusion of Blackmore to the north and, and different things as the setting developed, um, you can see it's a really good study in, in that sort of organic growth and the world setting feels more natural or realistic because of it. You know, we end up with some inconsistencies in places that just happen as, you know, things were, oh, wait, I need to change or I forgot about or, you know, it doesn't always fit nicely into a little box. And, you know, when you get into an area, it can make it feel more real uh, to, in that regard. Yeah, more realistic. Mm -hmm. so One the, of the big things I like about it is that it's very um, Blue Oyster Cult. Right, it was the castle of Greyhawk and the city of Greyhawk and the world of Greyhawk. <laughs> sure, uh, you know, bad company on that one. Bad, bad company, bad bad company. Yeah, <laughs> or St. Louis or New York. Yeah, the city Chicago. of Italian state of. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, the world of Greyhawk box set was released in 1983 by TSR, and they expanded on the box set of the campaign world, and it just kept going from there. Yeah. So, so 1983, the original box set. You see here behind me, you have the original box. Mm -hmm. It came with two books and the map we have That's on the wall. That's got glare. There, there we go. go. So, in the map we have up there. Yeah, let's go ahead and get that map up real quick there, Mr. Producer. We also Do have, I have the... Yeah, it's on the, the one um, show off. Down it's going to be closer here. to what you were using already, dude. Oh, it's going to be up here? Yeah. Again, so if I anybody need... out there can <laughs> handle the computer uh -huh. keys to uh, yeah. change cameras. So, yeah, pull it up. So, this is one of the things that uh, was, well, no, the map itself has a lot going on. We'll talk a little bit more. I've got some notes on the, like the map process. But in, what was it, 84? You get this box? 83. 83. 83. So the, the the world had been developed since like 74. 72. 72. Yeah. And it wasn't until 83 that we get finally a a box. Well, until... And what's interesting, this is called volume three. Yes. Until <laughs> um, that time... 
Uh, World study existed in notebook pages on Gary Gygax's desk, and that's it. You can find a lot of information in various Dragon Magazine articles as well. So right? that where so, first edition was played. Did so they... There's a lot of Dragon Magazine articles where they were doing things, and there's also it's called the Greyhawk Gazetteer. It was a magazine that was coming out on a monthly basis, specifically and only for the world of Greyhawk. So you can get your updates there. What were the board keen enough to this week? What was rare yeah, the, this week? The <laughs> weekly news in Greyhawk. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things you'll see. Oh, I can't that believe they're raising taxes. unnecessarily again. large stack of notes here. <laughs> but particularly when you go into the section of the timeline, yes. and you're like, oh, and this year they did this. You're like, yep. well, that was those guys playing that weekly game. That was and those that was guys. A, and you, I mean, yeah. I've got citations here. Dragon 241, page 75. Yep. LGG, page 34. I mean, these articles were like, hey, guys, guess what we did? <laughs> and it's not unlike what you would find now in a forum group or a Discord where you've got your, your group of DMs and maybe you're all running Curse of Strahd and you're sharing your notes and building up the world that's, setting. and things. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. But before the Internet, you had to publish it. Yeah, it was very much in those fan just, magazines. To spread it out there, absolutely. So Dragon Magazine and the Gray Hopkins Letter, uh, anybody come across any of those out there, I, I highly recommend that you get them because mm -hmm. they will help expand your world, especially if you're playing in Greyhawk. Not, not, not only that. Mention, they're full of great ideas you can put anywhere. Well, I mean, they're all very well done and very well written because I think it's a kind of a side effect of the internet today that people are allowed to release half-finished products and they can just update them later. We see no, the these had to be 100% complete, ready to go. They, they were 99% yeah. of the time, they were done 100%. And were never updated later. Right. You know, and you couldn't really do that unless you reprinted it so and re-released it. One of the, uh, the, the famous sayings of Gary Guy Guy, so, well, if you don't like it, change it. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. during an interview, he said uh, something to the effect of, God help us, if they ever discover, they don't need the rules to play the game. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it was a volume of material that was put out. Mm -hmm. Volume of material. He, uh, some things I've read uh, about him personally, mm -hmm that he was working 12 to 14 hours a day on a computer typing stuff. So his head was full of things he was trying to get down on paper. Yeah. And then he, his, his health deteriorated, and he went from working 14 hours a day to two hours a week. Yeah. And it got yeah, pretty, pretty tough on him. And then as D&D &D gained in popularity, some of the things that were coming out around the time, there was uh, Dragonlance was, mm -hmm. like, exploded. We got Forgotten Realms. He was doing the, the Dungeons & Dragons cartoon that ran for two years. Yeah, so I love that person. You know, it, he would, well, Ed Greenwood and level things, one Tiamat. <laughs> yeah, level one. That was like episode one or something. But uh, <laughs> uh, there was just a lot going on with D and D, and with him as the sort of head and driving force behind TSR, definitely yes. kept him pretty busy. Oh, he was very, very busy. Anyway, it's, to go back to the the big concept, one of the things uh, Boris was talking about how to build a world. Uh, I like to do it from. I start with a little village and I go up from there and just in concentric rings around my little village. Mm -hmm. So uh, Gary kind of did the same thing, started with a castle of Greyhawk, which on this map here is near the center. You can see a bright yellow spot. It's the bright desert. Yeah, it's and like just northwest here. of it is the city of Greyhawk. And so, yeah, um, you yeah. see it there in the map. Yeah, that's. Right. I so don't we have mouse this, but it's in the middle of the map. Yeah, so, literally. <laughs> so this is continent Greyhawk. Well, okay, it, the continent is known as Greyhawk. This yeah. is the world. If you imagine a globe, Greyhawk is, well, when we talk about uh, Gary's making his map, he took an old map of the United States and started drawing on it with the markers and crayons or whatever he had handy. And he put Greyhawk where Chicago is. Because he's from Chicago, and he thought that it should be the center of the world. <laughs> but so, you know, you start where you are, and that's where a lot of maps end up, right? So, like, yeah, if I, start. yeah, if I were gonna to draw a map of things around me, I'm gonna start where I am. I draw my little house in the middle right. of the paper. So, City Greyhawk, and we make a lot of fun of it, but it is a very large, large city. Thousands of people living there. There's a large walled city. It's, they've had uh, like old England or Paris. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, old Paris is a very good comparison. It's very large, very walled, very <laughs> medieval. Um, so the continent that the map is of is of Greyhawk. Yeah. The world, the whole globe, he named Oreth, O-E-A-R-T-H. Yeah. And on that continent, he also has other places that he talks about, but he never made a map or anything for. Well, that was one of the things that was so interesting about the setting of Greyhawk is 
it was so captivating. There was there was a lot going on in the official material, but Warehawk as a setting is, you know, when you when you read some of this, you get three or four paragraphs on a country. You're like, well, where's all the detail? You were expected as the game master to fill in what was necessary for you to have your adventures or, or be, you know, go around the world setting. There's and enough. that that feature that became a feature of the setting, so that you could you it was very sandboxy, and you never needed to expand. Unlike where we see Forgotten Realms, and it's not that they needed to expand it, but we had, we had inclusions for Mazteca and mm -hmm. Oriental Adventures, and you end up with you know the Forgotten Realms and Faerun and sort of the middle, right? And then we've got the whole world setting, the whole planet has been fleshed out in Forgotten so, Realms. Uh, Greyhawk Continent on the planet of Olerth, it was just one small portion of it. Yeah, let's so, imagine the country, the continent of Greyhawk is the size of the United States. Yeah. So there's more here than just the United States. Right. And the, the region that it inhabits is known as the Flannis. And it's the eastern part of the continent of Oort. Because you'll see on our map, if you bring that back up. Oh, well, that's actually here behind me. So, um, Mr. Producer. Um, I'm just going to do so there, this one. He's clicking buttons. <laughs> there it is. So we've got like the sea of dust here. Uh, put me up on the thing. <laughs> I'm trying to put him on the thing. I'm trying to vein a light. <laughs> well, I'd, the only one that I have is that's it. This that's one. It. Yeah. Yeah. So you and your hat. There you go. But so that camera's a little low. It's fine. It'll be alright. But we, yeah, we have the Sea of Dust, the Dry Step. Uh, I was having a hard time, but Greyhawk is up in this area. And so, th but this region here, this is the Flannis, and you can see it's the eastern part of the continent of Oork, and then that is on the planet of Oorth. Uh, this setting did get additional fleshing out in Spelljammer, not beyond this region, but in the section for gray space as a whole. And one of the yeah. things that's interesting about that is Oerth is literally the center of that planetary system. Well, of course yeah. it is. Um, and and Chicago's right in the middle of all of it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Chicago. <laughs> uh, but it was just an, an interesting feature, especially as we, we saw additional material come to D&D. It is the only one like that, and so I'm pretty sure that the um, fundamental churches of Greyhawk were very happy that Oerth was, in fact, the middle of their universe. <laughs> yeah, but it's not flat. Uh, no. no, it's not flat. It's banana shaped. <laughs> <laughs> it's banana shaped, and it is the center. So, I had to talk to my doctor about that one time. So yeah. the fact that Gary Gygax, hopefully everybody out there knows who this guy is. So then, just real briefly, he is the father of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, he is credited with the not the sole creator of, but him, his friends, and his family and his kids built a game from literally nothing yeah. and started having fun with it way back when. Yeah. So a lot of the names of those very first characters have been carried through the years into spell titles and to magic items and artifacts, and I just want to go through some of them well, because they're they're I love them. I love can, them. Let, well, we can deal with that a little bit. Let's finish up some of the map stuff because we got. Um, the map's right there. Sure, but the uh, the story of the map is actually really interesting because when this uh, we got what's largely hailed as a disappointing release in um, the early '80s, it was like a 36-page book, but it came with the map that you saw behind it, mm -hmm. and that blew people's minds. It set the standard for what was to be expected for a map for a world setting or, or RPG maps in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the longest time. I mean, it was the standard. Yeah, it was the first box set world setting. Uh, Forgotten Realms was shortly after. Right. Uh, but those maps were done even before this box set. This box set mm -hmm. included them again. So the way the map itself was done is that uh, Gary Gygax came to the artist, whose name I forget, this lady. Uh, I apologize for that. There's a bunch of them. <clears throat> well, th there's one lady in particular that was responsible for this. Oh, yes. For the map. Yes. And he found out how large a printing they could have from their printer, and you know, that set the scale because each it's a hex map, and each yeah. hex is thirty miles. Can't really see it in the video, but each one of these, there's certainly yeah. the whole map is hexed out, and it has these grid lines across the side. Yeah. yeah. So, so you've got a grid, but it's a hex grid, and those each of those is thirty hex miles. Kind of interesting, but when he knew. When he learned from the artist what it, their maximum printing size was, that allowed Gary Gygax to go and say, okay, I can make this map at this scale. And he gave her a rough sketch, because at that point, they sort of 
uh, I've gotten away from his like overlay of the U.S. into a couple different things based on some development, the inclusion of Blackmore, and some different things that were developed through uh, collaborative efforts. And so he gives her this rough sketch, and then she puts together this map. This map was done um, by hand. It was done with multiple levels of paper. And she even includes contours for the depths of the oceans. It's um, everything was yeah. done is fully hand lettered, like the whole nine yards. It took a while. I mean, you can kind of you can kind of see here how much darker this spot is than the rest of it. Yeah. But so this is very light, and then that's kind of darker, and that's actually a little bit lighter, and then it gets much darker and much darker. So there's actually contour lines to show you the elevation and the oceans and, and lakes and such. Yeah, for depth. And so, but what's interesting is you, she took the paper and then she'd stack the other one and did all this, built it out by hand, then took some photographs, and those photos were what were sent to the printer to give us these maps. Yeah, and so this map has been largely unchanged. Um, there have been a couple different versions as we go through Greyhawk into the wars, different boundaries and things that have changed. Uh, but unlike where we talked about Dragonlance, nobody dropped a mountain on anything. <laughs> so we don't have large earth-shattering movements, but we we do have different areas that will change depending on the timeline of Drag or sorry Greyhawk that you decide to play in. Uh, but the, the creation of the map is is really interesting to me because of what it took at the time to get this thing together to go to print. Now we can go into uh, you know any software, some of the software that I use, free software. Can make this map in absolute detail and add drop shadows and this or that. I can get photo realism, do any number of things, and then ship it off to a printer and have a map made for 20 bucks, uh, which was not the case. So these things, even though it was uh, the original 36 page book that was um, not the most well received as it did, you know, start to begin to flush out Greyhawk, which is why when we get the box, it's the third volume. <laughs> yeah. um, those maps changed the tone and really uh, started to allow the, the content that came later, the modules, the game materials, to have somewhere to be, to, to put context to them and, and allow further world development by the game masters that were playing in Greyhawk. Yeah, so. Well, they, they do have calendars in here. Do yeah, they have, they're like, They're not as, as extensive as Forgotten Realms. Sure, and that, that's, that was the other thing. As I mentioned, it doesn't doesn't have the gobs and gobs of detail. No. Uh, but in that, I think a little bit that's interesting as you as you study these different settings and, and start to pull things forward. It, you definitely like um, Dragonlance and Ravenlock, like Ed Greenwood style, versus what we see in the way that um, Forgotten Realms were put together and the way Gygax and crew put together. So Gygax uh, in, a, one of the, in Gazetteer and the uh, Dragon Magazine article, he, he wrote a how to convert basic deities from deities and demigods yeah, yeah, into that, a Greyhawk god well, from your campaign. Because this this original box did not include no, deities. It, it does. Well, uh, we're in uh, there, but there's not that many. Right, and so to flesh that out, and then in particular they were talking about monstrous racist deities, too. Right, yeah. And yeah. so that was, that was an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the deities and demigods supplement to uh, first edition Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, there was an inclusion here, but uh, depending on the, the publication, they get as few as, I think, 36 and as many as over 200. Right. And so, <laughs> yeah, uh, the Greyhawk said he doesn't have very many unique deities. Yeah, there's a lot that but, was drawn from, like, actual Celtic yeah. lore or things like that. Yeah. He, he, was, he was very good with uh, turning stuff from history into stuff from the game. Right, which was just, when you when you know who he was... That was his interest. Um, so he had a, a lot of interest in history, archaeology. Um, that's military, why he did the war gaming and military stuff. Military yeah. miniatures. That's, that's where he gets to. Yeah. So some of the regions you'll find in um, Greyhawk are uh, the Bathlunish Basin. There you go. Wait, what? <laughs> uh, so, and then some of these um, names change also after the war. So uh, we end up with the Bitter North or Old Black North. Right, and, and so Blackmore was the first world's well, It was one of the. It was the first supplement to the white box, right? And then yeah. Greyhawk came out. But that that setting was developed by another author, and then included as part of Greyhawk as it developed. But yeah. and so 
Greyhawk. So we put, we'll just drop, I mean, literally just drop Blackmore in above it as he's working on his building of the world. Uh, that was how they ended up in the north. The Empire of Ayus, or the Northern Reaches. You don't want to go there. <laughs> yeah, don't, go there. don't go there. Uh, see, the, you see right there? Right there? Don't yeah, go right there. Don't go right there. Don't. Just don't. Uh, the Thanorlian Peninsula, or the Barbarian North. Uh, where we have the wolf nomads, the tiger nomads, well, giants, yeah, have, just bad news. You have wolf and tiger nomads, but you also have uh, frost, snow, and ice barbarians. Yeah, so as you go giants, further north, it yeah. gets colder, so you go from frost to snow to ice. Mm -hmm, for sure. Yeah. Uh, the Shalimar Valley, or Old Keyland, and then uh, the western near Div, or Old Farand. Uh, let's see, the Old Airdy West, or Old Nyron. And the old Airdy East, the former great kingdom of the East. Uh, and then other regions on the edges, we've got the Armido Jungle and the Sea of Dust. <laughs> so, the yeah, Sea of Dust uh, is where's the jungle? I just see lots of sand. This jungle down the south. Uh, the Armido Jungle oh. here at the bottom, yeah. behind my head. I'm sorry, everybody. Yeah. So, the Armido Jungle, yeah, the Sea of Dust, the Dry Step. So, uh, there's a peninsula there called the Pomarge. Yeah, here. Down there. Yeah. Um, that's full of your orcs and goblins and hobgoblins, and they're constantly in war with themselves in that area. And the Wild Coast is pretty cool. You have uh, five, three city states that all claim this area is mine. Yep. <laughs> so they're pirates and hijinks. Some of the uh, the adventure from um, was it Ghosts of Salt Marsh, I believe. The five E adventure yeah. is all water themed, and some of those came out of Grey Hawkins. Yes, yeah, so adventures you have, in that area. Yeah. The bright desert right in the center. Right there. Right there. <laughs> uh, when you get into the history of Greyhawk, it used to be called the Bright Forest. And then two wizards had a fight out there, <laughs> and now it's the Bright Desert. <laughs> so two wizards turned a lush tropical uh, forest into a nothing. <laughs> and, and there is a the civilization that was out there at the time actually moved underground for safety, and they're still there, and I had that adventure as well. I have a lot of... <laughs> Greyhawk. One of the and, things that I love Greyhawk. One of the things that's really fun about Greyhawk is um, because not everything's detailed, not everything's been pinpointed on a map exactly. Mm -hmm. um, it works really good if you, from a sense of like archaeology, there's a lot of wonders and hidden things to find or be rediscovered. Mm -hmm. um, oh, some of the, the history you can pull forward. There's one thing that we found that was talking about um, mm -hmm. like ancient machines and stuff that would be found in some of the dungeons and adventures so, so, that, so that one was an interesting it feels like it's a, a one-shot goofball one but adventure to or some of the barrier peaks and yeah you end up in a crashed alien spaceship yeah so i mean that's really cool though because it's like more you know like higher technology lower magic but it is still magic fantasy setting so it's more i would say like king arthur where it's yeah, like it's... magic and mysticism not necessarily high fantasy magic where everyone's throwing fireball and lightning bolt everywhere when we go through and classify a, a world setting or even adventures, we ask them if it's a high magic or high adventure, a uh, high fantasy. And uh, Greyhawk is a high fantasy mid magic. There are places where magic almost doesn't exist, and there's other places where magic is all they do. You have the Valley of the Mage. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it, I mean, it says the mage. There's only one guy there. No. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, I can show you. I got two books. Two books, uh, several pages long. It's just a write-up on their college. And I actually took that and used it in my campaign in Greyhawk. Yeah. Um, and basically, it's a university for magic users. They want to go and, and advance their knowledge and their, their proficiency with stuff. And they do not care if you're good, bad, or indifferent. They want to know how the magic is going to be used. Yeah. And so they study some of the stuff that's not considered. They study, you know, the, the dark side. For sure. So you yeah. can protect from it. Mr. Producer, if you could make an adjustment to uh, one camera there. And then um, the other thing. Wrong, wrong way. Yeah. Wrong way. So. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention that's interesting, alignment doesn't feature as heavily in 5th edition as we would expect to have it feature in our 2nd edition earlier, the older sure. games. You see alignment really play a role in the descriptions of different countries and, and this 
the idea that it's more of a cosmic force. Law, order, chaos, mm -hmm. disorder, good and evil. Um, there's a lot of that that really plays out, you know, so in the lands of Ayuz, it is evil. So, uh, Greyhawk took that one step further. Well, that's what I mean. It's, they actually made a map, hold it up there, Mr. Producer, of the general alignment of the countries. Pull back some. So I'm trying to just get... It, it needs a little chart, but There we go. So, the countries have their general alignment. Uh, you know, good, evil, Let's chaos, see if I can get the individual that. countries on there. So... Nice. Uh, as well as you know, your characters obviously don't. If the country is lawful good, you don't necessarily have right. to be lawful good. But for you as a DM, if you're trying to figure out my adventuring party is going to go over here, where are they going to run into? Right. Well, so you're thinking about the country. I have a question. There's only a few paragraphs, but when you look at this map, you can say, oh, well, it's lawful good over here, so right. this should be safe. So, what if you have a lawful good character that goes to a lawful evil nation, and do they have to follow the evil laws in order to be lawful good still? It, it's, it depends on the laws, but yes. <laughs> so you, you, you remember, laws about structure and order. Right. right. Good so, and evil is a morality. So, if there was a law in the right. books that said every time you pass this little urchin girl, you have to give her a boot to the face, and the paladin doesn't do it, is he breaking the law? Actually, he, actually what I did in a situation like that, there was uh, people in the stocks. And when you were in the, uh, the the square, the town square, each of the stocks had buckets of stuff to throw at them and switches, so you could switch them on the bottom of their feet. And there were people there watching. And if you didn't do it properly, you were going to spend time in the stocks. Oh wow! So our it wasn't lawful good, but we had a ranger in the group. I think it was chaotic good. He had a lot of problems with that because of the people that were there in the stocks. Didn't look like you were running about thugs. Sure. You know, they looked like street urchin. You know, I think one of them, uh, the mom had stolen food because her husband had gone off to war and he never came home. And she's just trying to feed her kids. But she stole. Mm -hmm. So they put her in the stocks. And she was supposed to spend so many days in the stocks. Well, now her kids are at home with no mom. No food. But she has mm -hmm. to spend time in the stocks. So he's like, I don't want to do that. I'll, you know, I'll go. Well, you can't. You you have to. She has to spend five days in the stocks, and everybody that goes through the town square has to do these things. And yeah. he had a real hard time with it. it. It became a really good debate with character alignment, sure. and just how far do you take that kind of stuff into the game? Uh, we had a really heated discussion that night. I remember because, you know, uh, for example, if I had a chaotic evil. Uh, uh, thug, you know, a, a rogue assassin, whoever. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, DM, this girl that's in the bar, she slumped me off. I'm going to hang around outside till she comes off work. I'm going to grab her. I'm going to knock her in the head. I'm going to take her behind the club, and I'm going to rape her. But how far do you play that? Right. Should it yeah, be that that's... and done, or do you want to play that? Because there are players who also want to, well, I'm going to pay the bartender at, you know, for one of the nights, uh, for a night yeah. for one of the girls. Well, how far do you want to play that? No, yeah, there's some people that play it, and uh, then there's other people that have like uh, that role play relationships in the party, that kind of stuff. That that's all comes down to yeah, cons personal you know boundaries and consent, things like that. Yeah, personal play taste. But yeah. we're getting we're getting sidetracked with minutia. What we're talking about here are the the features of this the world setting where you've got these countries that have generalized alignments because we're. Greyhawk and early D&D, but Greyhawk in particular, treats these forces as cosmic. So, and we see this later in Planescape, where we're dealing with the planes of law, the planes mm -hmm. of chaos, and the blood war. This yeah. uh, infinite war between law and chaos. So yeah, you'll you have... think about these alignments, they're a general feel for the place. So right. and it, Missouri it... is different than Georgia. Right. If you go to Georgia, the culture is just a little different there. Mm -hmm. That's not saying they're bad or, or better. It's just saying it's different. So this is just a way to let the DMs know when they're putting together an adventure, the general feel of this link. Yeah, particularly because when you get three to four paragraphs of, you know, this guy, this king, maybe a little bit about sort of what their goals are or their troubles they're having in that land, you pair that with some of their other uh, generalized like alignment, and now you get an idea of what you're going to experience in the land. Um, that sort of stuff. One of the things that was nice about this 
is that Greyhawk doesn't have a ton of analogs for existing cultures. Like, you can't come over here and say, oh, look, that's the, the French. Those are the Germans. This is the, the Swedish. Those are Native American. Oh, look, I accidentally found Spain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so without drawing on those sorts of analogs, um, you're, you've got a lot more flexibility to add those details yourself um, as a game master. You can develop cultures, style of dress, particular laws, um, and this information was meant to guide you in that direction and provide uh, context to compare it to its neighbors. You know, so if you have a, a huge lawful good, and then over here this sort of chaotic, neutral um, con countries, you can see where they might butt heads and have different conflicts. Now, they're not necessarily the same as if you have a lawful evil, or sorry, chaotic evil and lawful good next door neighbors, they're probably going to want to cancel each other out. Yeah. <laughs> but um, in, in this way, you've got more context, and it really reinforced the idea of alignment, particularly in the earlier editions of Dungeons Dragons. This is also the only world setting that I know of that has this kind of map. You get out of any other one that has a map the alignments of the, of the country. Well, Greyhawk is also the only place that I know of where um, character alignments is actually a pretty big deal. So, like, if you're a cleric and you do something that's out of character, your alignment can change, and that change in alignment can really mess up your whole deal about being well, you're, a cleric. You're, messing, you're mixing Greyhawk with 1st and 2nd yeah. edition. 1st and 2nd edition is where those rules came from. Oh, I man, that's when this came out. This well, this is, yeah, the, this is a setting, not the game rules. Right, so there was a lot of um, if you were a cleric, if you were a paladin, um, and, and even other ra other character classes, if you chose a deity for your character, one of the reasons you would do that is it's going to help you uh, have a general feel for your character. If I worship a dwarven god, I'm going to be, I might have these beliefs. If I worship an elven god, I'm going to have these other beliefs. And that would help you as a player, help to define your character a little bit. I follow Lynn, uh, Golden Beard. I'm gonna follow. I'm gonna do some of these things. If I follow Alona, Mistress of the Hunt, I'm gonna do these other. Well, things. Well, I was, well, what I was saying is like in here, right? If you went to a country that was opposed to your alignment, and you had to do some things that are opposed to your alignment, could potentially shift your characters. Depends on how all in you go in. Right. right. So yeah. For sure. That's so that's what I was talking about. Is that Greyhawk seems a little bit heavier in that aspect. Well, again, it's like the first and second edition. Greyhawk was the first world setting, so we got played a lot. Yeah. So Greyhawk, what you're what you're thinking of, yeah, that happened in Greyhawk, but it was first and second yeah. edition. And and that's that's but that is a feature of Greyhawk where that mixes so heavily. It's as I talked about before because we're dealing with the first world setting and it's and how instrumental this was in the development of Dungeons and Dragons. You see a lot of those things overlap, and alignment's one of them. And this is again really interesting to have these countries have defined generalized alignments. So that you can contextualize them. Yeah. yeah. So and you uh, you can apply that same concept. Star Wars. You have a Jedi and you're a Sith, and you have dark side points. Yeah. So if you're a Jedi yeah. and you do something bad, you know you kick the orphan in the face. The GM's going to say you got a dark side point. Yeah. Watch yourself. But it doesn't mean you've fallen all the way. Right. So, so it, it's a way for the GM of the game to let you know, hey, you're really not playing your character as you've written him. You and what I typically will ask. Do you want to change that, or do you want to get back on the path that you described? And, and the character that, sheet is how you describe your character. Right. But to that point, it lets you play these regions and things too. So oh, absolutely. If, if I if I take my group of adventurers <laughs> and we end up in Iuz, because I know that they're a chaotic evil and um, general, I know what they should expect to run into, mm -hmm. and that allows you to build those um, those interpersonal or, or like character level personal conflicts right do i go and i smack this woman's feet with the switch and throw stuff at her i i personally can you know the character becomes conflicted yeah. about this sort of thing because of their worldview versus what the laws and customs of that that place are um it doesn't necessarily mean you've got like undead and stuff walking around or that they're gonna just run around and stab everybody to death uh, but it, it definitely should inform you as the game master as to their general outlook on morality, they might be more tyrannical and harsh in their punishments with less, um, yeah. you know, formal processes where a lawful good may have uh, a better justice system and, and those sorts of things, be more interested in better outcomes. And, Typically, uh, I'll, I'll give you a taste of how bad it is here without mm -hmm. making uh, everybody, all the players at the table get 
nervous, upset, and, or, and that that comes to being a good game master. You don't yeah. want to ruin or, or or upset your game or start to breach some of those consent and things like that in the table. But it, it does allow you to provide that flavor, that background, and say, okay, we know these guys are really doing some things um, that go against like the general universal moral code, and I can justify my actions, or I can I can understand where they're coming from and why we have to stop them now. Without yeah. without really yeah, upsetting yeah. stuff. So, I want to show this other map over here to this, the other side of this page. The other side of that page has a map on general uh, resources, such as gold, silver, lumber, uh, things of that nature. So, so if you have uh, an adventure going on in one place, and you're looking for an idea, uh, one of my favorite things, okay, especially low level, low level, under seventh level, so what do kobolds do? They mine. Right. So <laughs> what do dwarves do? They also mine. They also mine. They and, typically mine and, into each other. Well, <laughs> and early gnomes also mine. Yep. They're, yes. So what if dwarves have a, have a somewhat prosperous silver mine? They're happy dwarves, aren't they? Oh, yeah. What about the kobolds that just came across them? No. no. <laughs> they want so, that. Or maybe <laughs> the kobolds find you, the same. If you color. have a map where it shows the resources on that area. Yeah. And you pay attention to what the map shows. They can inspire you with ideas like that on mm -hmm. what to do. Yeah, and we we always talk um, usually a little late in the program about commerce and economics. This is some of the information that you need as a game master Absolutely. to inform those Absolutely. those sorts of um, those plot points that we've talked about, where those can feature as um, sticking points or adventure hooks. Um, it's very cool to have it, and it's done for the whole all the regions. So you have like major exports. Um, and that can also inform you as to how we've got something going Oh, on no. There. What was that? It looks like our power cord's not working. Oh. Hold on, guys. We might lose the stream. There oh, we go. That helps. <laughs> All right. We're plugged back in. Press is averted. <laughs> yeah, a little battery thing is moving up and everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, they probably came unplugged when we had to jump out with all the rain that hit us suddenly, trying to go get some of that <laughs> stuff put away. So, um... We're going to post your position... Good job. Yeah. Just suplex him out of his body until he's body is <laughs> but, Well, like I said, as long as you can find someone that can beat the press of free. <laughs> oh, hey, we're willing to double it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, that was one of the things that um, while these books might be um, uh, less full, but, well, they're, they're definitely they're packed. It's all just text and text and text, yeah, it's which you text. cannot see because of the lights. But um, you know, well, we only have about 70 pages worth of stuff here, but it's all, it's all full. really uh, dense. It's information dense. And that was one of the things that made these, the, particularly the box release, uh, so much of a boon to playing in Greyhawk. That, you know, the earlier stuff is nice, but this is kind of the core of it, and this is sort of where you start. This is uh, more of the geography. Yeah, the glossography, they call it. Yeah. yeah this one. Um... What's the weather like in different areas? Mm -hmm. Mountains versus desert versus wooded. Uh, as a note, they, they've gone so far as to define the axial tilt of the planet, which is 30 degrees. Which makes climate change quite well, a real well, thing. Yeah, you know, so, so so your your swings between seasons is much more Very drastic. Very dramatic. Much more dramatic. Earth is about 12? 23. 23? Yeah, we keep knocking about it. <laughs> it's actually moving. It's it's been moving faster in recent years. It's actually over by Greenland right now. Well, you're talking about the, the magnetic, magnetic north, yeah. No, we're magnetic. Magnetic. I'm talking about axial tilt. tilt. Yeah, tilt. 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 three and a half degrees. Okay. What's up? Also, they made a hardback yeah. version of these two books together, yeah. and it also has a few other things in it, other random charts and some uh, ideas for adventures. And uh, the descriptions for the cities and the countries go into a little bit better. Uh, they also talk about some of uh, some of the uh, uh, great NPCs are mentioned yeah. in here as well. Yeah, and some of the monsters. So as we look at, at some of the stuff here uh, we got behind us, talk about this. Uh, the World of Greyhawks box set here behind Troy. These uh, books that we've been showing off, published in 1983. Greyhawk Adventures. So this book here. Uh, sort of the update with some new material and some fleshing 80, out. 80? 89. 89. So hardback, um, oh, first and second edition style. 
Um, this is actually just before we get some of the second edition. So later yeah. in 89, we got a uh, second edition player's handbook. Right. And this came out to sort of update the world setting to get it ready for second edition. Uh, the city of Greyhawk itself. So we well, got the city of Greyhawk down here. Yeah, city of Greyhawk. Uh, also released in '89. This is a box set for just the city. Uh, you can you can uh, yeah, grow up, live, and die. Level one to twenty, all the way through the city. Never leave uh, the city. And some of the novels, there weren't as many as we found with Dragonlance, um, but some of the novels featured a character called the Gray Mouse. He was the V. Badass thief, yeah. and he had a partner. What the hell is it? I, I can't remember his buddy's name, but the two of them were a team, and they were the dark underbelly of the city. Very mm-hmm. They grew up stealing bread, and then later in life, they, they wound up running everything. Yeah, so very cool uh, system, um, similar to what we got in Forgotten Realms for the city system box set, but this features uh, just the city of Greyhawk and surrounding areas. This is one of the two books from the box set for the Castle Greyhawk. Mm-hmm. I, this is all I have left. I don't know what happened to the rest of it. Yeah. But it had two books and a whole stack of maps, and that's all I got left. And this was released a little bit later, because one of the things that's interesting about Greyhawk, the castle, um, as we mentioned a little bit, yes. it's um, that it's it's 13 levels of dungeon so underneath like 88 this, as well. the castle. Yeah, so this uh, came out in 88. When uh, Gary Guy guy started his uh, his playing at his home, mm-hmm. uh, he started with the Castle Greyhawk and the dungeons underneath. Yeah, that was his. They, they were all dungeon crawls for his. They're all dungeon crawls, one dungeon after another after another. And in his game world, he got to uh, 50 levels. We just read a little bit, but in the published material, there's only 13. Yeah, and, and we've been cheated. <laughs> well, uh, probably an interesting thing here. Um, the credit, I forget. So, not, not Gary Gygax. It's taken off of his notes, but at right. the time this was put together and released, uh, Gary was working um, in California, which is the opposite side of the country from TSR, yeah. on the, uh, the Dungeons cartoon. and Dragons cartoon. So um, that took most of his time. He wasn't able to be a part of this project, but they did take his original notes and writing and did have his input. So this is very much Gary's uh, dungeon, his initial sort of oh, absolutely. ideas for his dungeon. Um, later we get Greyhawk Wars. And Greyhawk Wars is interesting because it was developed as a sort of uh, miniatures battle game. Mm-hmm. But the box set describes a large, uh, I mean, continent-encompassing war uh, that starts off with Ayuse. Starts with Ayuse, because <laughs> uh, he's the, uh, the god of death and uh, other badness. See? I told you not to go there. And uh, so he decides one day that he wants more. And so he puts together a huge army, and in his army are necromancers. And what do necromancers do? Make more armies. Make more armies. <laughs> so <laughs> as he goes forth and he attacks and kills stuff, his necromancers raise them so his army grows in size. And then they start spreading out everywhere. And uh, he yeah, so almost wins. I use God of Pain and Oppression. Yeah. That's that's him. <laughs> okay. That is him. Hold on, man. I use the evil. I use the conqueror. Now, I use the unending as my favorite. Now, what's what's interesting too, as a god, he literally sits there in the country. Yeah. That's it's yeah. named for him. That's where he sits. Um, he of course has his other domains and things that you would expect from a deity, uh, but he is a deity, and he likes to hang out and cause problems and do all this yeah. stuff there on Earth. Well, well, <laughs> the, the, the Roman and Greek gods they hung out on Earth for sure. So. Why not? <laughs> uh, it's just one of those things where you, you typically see, like, oh, the, the, the gods were here, and they did this stuff, and then they left. Or, you know, in different settings. But he's, he's, he's sitting in a chair in his up. office writing some paperwork. <clears throat> I got 500 more skeletons. Actively <laughs> brought in. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we had but, Greyhawk Wars, and it comes as a whole continent. What's interesting about this, if, if you pay attention to the early stuff, I mean, like, it's got cool tiles. I mean, this is full-on war game stuff. It is war game stuff. Um, but it's got another set of maps in the box. Yep. Um, and it shows, you know, who makes what move where. Um, yep. As a note, there, there's um, a lot of information about how to, to prosecute and then play a game through the wars. Um, and there's also a lot of information from some really good game masters out there that have played in Greyhawk for a long time about how players might be able to actually affect the course of the war. 
Um, so the, the canonical story definitely has a direction it's meant to go through here and these attacks and wins and losses with an eventual conclusion to get us into From the Ashes, which is the next set. Uh, but this can be a really cool time in Greyhawk's history. And if you oh. do end up playing in this area, be sure to check out that some of that information that's out there on YouTube in different groups um, about how players can really make changes and affect the course of the war. Uh, it's very cool. Um, a lot of really neat information. And this does end up um, redrawing some of the boundaries on the map, like I mentioned before. Some of them. But there's a lot um, that was really interesting, too, when you look at it that can lead up to this in some of the modules. Oh. Um, I've got, there was actually two modules that were released that set the stage for this. So, um, I'm trying to remember. I've got the numbers for them, but Craft Wars, that was released uh, in 91. And then 92, we hit From the Ashes. And you can see here, From the Ashes definitely sets a darker tone. We get, oh, yeah. um, we get, a, it's now a war torn landscape with more undead and evil. Um, yeah, it looks a lot like of... a vampire guy or something <laughs> on a dead horse. Yeah, that's some Mayu stuff. Coming yeah. <laughs> but uh, From the Ashes definitely gets you a little bit bleaker outlook. So we go more of that, some more grit, kind of like we'd expect in like a Conan the Barbarian series or something like that. And a little less polished, like you'd see maybe the Lord of the Rings. And we go, um, but we got a lot of socioeconomic disruption, a lot of fallout from the war, and uh, evil has a little bit more latitude to make some moves in this era of Greyhawk. So uh, that can also be an interesting time for adventurers um, as you're trying to stave off the encroaching darkness and reestablish, um, you know, safe and, and good in the, the world. Uh, let me see if I can find those modules. I've got the list of them. We've got 79 published works for um, World of Greyhawk, including supplements. Um, a little brother, can you grab my backpack? I've got a book over there. Um, because I'll talk about some of the really neat stuff. I've got, I don't think I've got 79, but I've got probably that close to half in the very bottom. There's a little book. Oh, your little notebook? Yeah, it's empty, but oh, it's in the very bottom. So, okay, so, so, uh, World of Greyhawk Swords modules. And my little book's got to be around. Uh, so WGS 1, which says 5 shall be 1. This one? Yep. And uh, WGS 2, Howl from the North. Well, I use it in the North, and that kicks off. Um, so those two modules, released in 91, describe the events leading up to the war, and then you kick off into Greyhawk Wars. Um, so this is one of the things that was really kind of fun about TSR, was that we had a ton of uh, play material. And so... While they would give you some of the background and stuff, it was up to you as the game master to kind of get your party there and do the, um, which is a skill in itself to get your people <laughs> where they're ready to actually go into the module. Um, but we had really good storylines throughout these modules that could set up these big adventures. Really, um, through there, we got additional detail in these regions. And mm -hmm. um, even still, there's a lot of room for game masters to bring in their, their portions of the game and uh, flesh out the details as they see fit. Oh, yeah. The, the world of Greyhawk, uh, it's what I cut my teeth on, so to speak, as a DM. And when I when I got the, the world of Greyhawk and I read it, and it's just two small books, like, this is awesome. I had the map laid on the table, and I'd look at it, mm -hmm. and see this is that, and this is that. Oh, this is cool. And after you read it, and this country does this, and this country does that, and this country does this, and... Here's their alignment. Here's what goods they produce. You're like, oh, why are there lands <laughs> that have elves right next to this place? That doesn't sound like a very... And so you read a little bit more, and they just have one line in there about border skirmishes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all they say. Because it's, it's just such a, uh outline of the countries and what's going on. And they give you hints and clues and suggestions right. on how to flesh out a, a country, a world, or even your outline for your adventure. It's really interesting to read the material because you know that there's like a big stack of notes, some three-ring binder somebody's got somewhere. And so you knew all this material, and these plans, and this, these storylines existed. When you read this, you're like, somebody's written it, and we're only getting about that much of it. We're only getting <laughs> that much of it. Um, 
That's a, that's a, a, exactly right. Yeah. Uh, so, so as an example, let me show you this one. So I use the evil. Obviously, this is set for the most part up in the land of I use. Mm -hmm. I use being the bad guy. Yeah. Or at least one of the top three mm -hmm. in in the gray heart. <clears throat> so <clears throat> so it's set in there. And it has a story, and the stories are pretty much the same mythology mm -hmm. as the fifth edition. We're going to set a story, and this is where it's taking place. And here's the land and some good general descriptions about the land and the people. Right. And then here's what's going on that you need to fix. And so the story will start like that, and then they get into some of the cities. So this is one of the city places where something is going on in the story, and it goes into greater detail. Because it's evil, it's called the City of Skulls. The City of Skulls. So this city, though, <laughs> in the world right up, doesn't even exist. It's not, it doesn't, it's not there. Right, they didn't plant it. Yeah. it right, I mean, it, it eventually got its own little booklet, but that right. was... So, yeah. So the City of Skulls <laughs> got its own adventure. Because it was so much fun, and tourists were wanting to go there all the summer long. They had to go back. You know, when you've got go one back. dinar in your pocket... And you and you're gonna, get the most, yeah, yeah, and you get the most vacation for your money. You can't go to Hawaii, but I got this place you've never heard of, and I guarantee <laughs> well, when it's going to be the most unique experience. When you and your family look back at all the fun places you went to over the years, you go, gosh darn it, I'd really like to go back to the City of Skulls. It, it is yeah. the most fun. You spend enough time there. It is the most fun you'll never want to have again. Yeah, and so <laughs> and technically its common name is Doraka, but in the local, it's the City of Skulls. But if the travel agent ever tells you that, and you get there, and your zombie, I'm pretty sure uh, bellboy is taking your bags up the room, and his arm falls off. I'm pretty sure Skeletor has a summer home there. Yeah, yeah it, it yeah. probably does. <laughs> so with fifth edition, when they write one of the adventures, mm -hmm. they'll incorporate into that module, that adventure module, yeah, enough information about the countryside that's going to affect the story. Like we like we talked about with our last last episode in Dragonlance. So and, when you get the Dragonlance module, that kind of yeah. Um, plays through back way back to first and second edition. Right. You're going to incorporate what's going on in the area because when we build a, a map or a country, mm -hmm. we're going to start small and I like to build out. It's easier that yeah. way. Yeah. You go from the general to the specific to, to specific. the yet even more specific. -er. Right. <laughs> and so when we, when we talk about, well, let's build your country, let's build your world setting, one of the things we suggest is you start small, yeah. make a little fishing village. You next to a river or a lake and an ocean, mm -hmm. and now you have to build a fishing village of 20 to 50 people. Um, who lives there? What are they fishing? What kind of fish? What, how much money do they make on average? Mm -hmm. It tells more about the river. Is it, has it a polluted river monster. from a city? Yeah. Is it an ocean? Is there a Loch Ness monster in it? Is, is it <laughs> if it's an ocean, do ships ever come here from other lands? Yeah. So you, you have a lot there to build on in just that little bit. So I understand why in the world setting books, they're like, the Sus Forest has two paragraphs about an entire forest that's that yeah, has, inhabited and all this stuff. Yeah, it's like half the well, size of that, Missouri. But yeah. they call it the Sus Forest, so it's a very, very suspicious forest that has no <laughs> description. It's because it's sus. Yeah, but yeah, it, 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 it is oh, over there looking there's very, a very suspicious. Hoodie with its hood pulled over its yeah. eyes, with yeah. Yeah, sunglasses on. Yeah, yeah. this one that's a better place called Wellwood Forest. It's inhabited by elves. Has one paragraph. Yeah. So that's and that's another forest that's. Half the size of the state of Missouri. Yeah, and it's like the Mark Twain National Forest. Right, so you got one paragraph about that. Mm -hmm. So you, as a dungeon master, writing up your world adventure for your your characters and your story that they're going to play through, this gives you a little bit of guidance in here. You're like, no, the Wolfwood is a really nice summer kind of place with elves. We need to go someplace. Oh, I know the Pomarge. That's oh, yeah, Pomarge and Goblins. Let's go there. Or what about the super suspicious forest with that, dryads and treants? <laughs> well, yeah, that's. When we talk about um, world building, generally there's there's two directions that you typically see to take. It's that top down where you start with your world map and kind of place some things, uh, your general geographies, um, and get get things settled out. And that's where you end up with a book similar to what you're going to find in the box set. Um, and the other direction is, particularly if you're working on homebrew and you're writing one shots and, and things sort of develop organically, is that story driven uh, story location out that that concentric rings yeah. until you grow into you've got a full world setting eventually starting with a little village yeah and then you go out 100 miles 
what other little villages or farming communities may live there mm -hmm. until eventually you get to a large organized city. And now you got to do governments, military, uh, who's their enemies, who's their friends, yeah. and this, trading partners, all these different things. This can be a great example too if you're if you're working on a world setting of your own. Uh, see what it takes. Like, oh, it only took a paragraph or two, and what information was in there, and then you're done. You move on. Yeah, it does not. If you're building a world setting, it does not take very much. And you, as the organizer of it, I would suggest, and we, I've suggested this to the other people, get a box of 5x7 file cards, and you write forest, and all the basics about it. It's, and on a file card, you can't put two or three, four lines, and you set that to the side. Desert, and you write two or three lines about the desert, and you're going to have cards about the terrain, mm -hmm. and then you're going to have cards about people. Yeah. Who lives there? What monsters live there? What kind of trade and commerce? What natural resources? There's a tremendous amount of things. So the next thing you know, you're going to have cards about people, you're going to have cards about resources, and then they're just going to start to fall together. Right. Who lives in a forest? Well, typically dwarves don't. Elves do. Right. Or you may have other types, especially monsters. Mm -hmm. Monsters are going to go to the lands that they like, water, uh, woods, mountains, desert. They're going to attract different creatures and different peoples and the people that live there are going to have very different cultures this is another thing we talked about mm -hmm. uh, in building your own world set yeah. so world of greyhawk i love it because it's what i grew up in mm -hmm. as, as a player to the dm and way back in the day when this came out uh, the guy that was our dm when i first started playing he didn't have <laughs> the money to buy it at the time it came out mm -hmm. and i showed up in our next game night with it <laughs> he's like oh cool he looked at me he says i want to borrow that and have you read it already yes i have nice <laughs> <laughs> of course i read it i bought it took it home and read it like a like a yeah freak. <laughs> that's what you do you're like okay i need to just like go ahead and insert into <laughs> it's in my head yeah oh we're in what country oh i know where we need to go and where we need johnny Pines input yeah Input, Stephanie. Input, Stephanie. So as we move through, like uh, we mentioned, some of the cultures are going to be your uh, general European medieval fantasy, but there's yes. not a ton of analogs. It's, uh, it's very medieval European, uh, the, the way right. everything is described and the artwork. And uh, so the it's very high fantasy. You know, dragons are rare, but they are vicious. Yeah, in this setting in particular, it's yeah, it's, very uh, deadly. Yeah, so when you, when you happen to see one, uh, it's because it let you see it, or it doesn't care that you saw it because it's that powerful, right? You know that sort of it, stuff. It either doesn't see you as a threat, or it sees you like lunch. Yeah, it's so you, you've seen it because it's chewing on. You. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's where we get into some of that. Um, but in that high fantasy setting, like I mentioned earlier, there's no particular analogs. So it gives you some flexibility to set styles of dress and things of that nature, oh, as, so, as compared to uh, Faerun has, you know, like the, the nine human cultures are, are fairly well defined, which is nice. And, you know, particularly as a player, I can go in and go, all right, human of this subculture, which means I, I, I may dress in this way or have these colors or, you know, this different this sort of thing. Uh, that information is not generally going to be found in, in the Greyhawk setting which allows you to either gloss over it or add the elements that are important to building your story and developing your world. Yeah, and uh, I was just wanted to touch on that. So, like, for Faerun, I feel like it is much, uh, like, prettier, more colorful, right? More flamboyant, I guess, right? And where Greyhawk would be, like, more of, like, that gritty 1960s detective <laughs> kind of stuff. You know, like, it's not... It's not it's not uh, Ravenloft for sure, where every tree is literally trying to kill you, but it's more, I would say, realistic, more, you know, King Arthur. Kinda... It's, it's, it's it's what you're getting. At, it's more grounded. Yeah. Um, because yeah. the setting um, is a lower level of magic than what you're going to find in Forgotten Realms, um, and that definitely sort should inform the cultures that you find them. So you know, larger, more established, safer areas, kingdoms. That's where you're gonna find your wizard school, your wizard yep. towers, your so wizards. You might end up with like less villages, more large cities, but mm -hmm. further spread out, kind of thing. Right, and then the small villages are gonna not like you're lucky to find a blacksmith. You're not gonna find yeah a wizard or a cleric. 
Um, and as you head further north into the barbarian lands, you're going to find a shaman or some sort of yep. spiritual mm-hmm. instead of more formal type spell casting stuff. Um, and as an example, you know, the world reflects that earlier D and D we had magic user. Which yeah. We know now in fifth edition as wizard sorcerer and warlock were not concepts in the game at the time. And so we don't no. see their parallels at all in Greyhawk. No. Uh, some of the races that you will not find in Greyhawk are dragonborn. Or, uh, well, I don't think the drow are there either, are they? they the drow they, are from Forgotten Realms. Well, I know, no, but they, they're in the Underdark and they can kind of travel, but I don't think they're in Greyhawk. There they are. There's a, a module that puts in there was uh, Queen of the Spiders. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but for the most part, you, they don't feature. Um, they are definitely a feature of Faerun, and so it's almost like the drow don't exist in Greyhawk. Um, and when you do run across them, extraordinarily rare. It's like a legend. Very, very rare. Yeah, they're thought not to exist at all. And then um, you didn't see a Bigfoot. And but, <laughs> you know, like the elf cultures that are out there actively hunt them. Yeah. Um, because of the lore that is drow and, and the things that came to pass to create they're them. Evil for sure. And then that's the other thing about uh, Greyhawk too. They are evil. So anything that's good, you know, they're going to try to cancel and each other out. There are. <laughs> There are several uh, countries that are written where the king or the prince is very much like the King Arthur uh, legend, where he can just at the drop of a hat call an army of heavy metal ironclad knights to go across the country and just kill this evil. I think think that's also a thing that made the... the game and cultures of the people feel a little bit grittier than uh, Faerun, because in Faerun, if you have a problem, they're going to have some high magic fantasy way to try to take care of it, right? Whereas in Greyhawk, if there's a problem, we're going to put an army together, we're going to come over and kick your door down, and we're going to talk about it's it. It's very, very, <laughs> very much um, 100 years war period. Yeah. Oh, it's you know, mercenary year. units, big very armies on the battlefield, yeah. you magic know, campaigns. Does, magic does exist, but it is uh, less... I won't say rare, but it's, it's not as abundant yeah. as some other world sites, such as Forgotten. And, and you got to remember, um, this is sort of from the white box, the development of white box, right? Mm-hmm. Where you, you had more archers, footmen, and those sorts of things. It, and Fireball is, was... This is 10 years after the white box. But the influence is still there. Absolutely. Yeah, where it's, where it's you combat. would have a wizard, and he cast Fireball, and the rule was, in this radius, the things are destroyed. Yeah. No saving throws, no damage, just well, flat destroyed. Well, destroyed and on fire. Well, this is... <laughs> in, 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 yeah, <laughs> insult to injury, yeah, on fire. Um, on fire. And we see that too with like, uh, first and second, well, first edition fireball had no damage cap. So at level 20, you're doing 20 D6. Yep. Uh, they cap it in second edition down to 10 D6 because they're like, oh my god, that's a lot. Particularly as Forgotten Realms and things like that became more of a prominent setting and magic was, you know, the party didn't like seeing fireball. Well, I mean, yeah, like fireballing. When a hobgoblin but, can throw a fireball at you, it t- kind of changes things. It so, does, but, but again, you see that in the cultures. I was like, how you can break the game. Okay. There's a module called Age of the Phoenix. I, I have it out there and I mm-hmm. played into it. I, I played it and then I bought it and I, I've run it. Mm-hmm. There's a magic item in there that you can find. It's a brooch that you wear that it will... You don't have to control it. Yeah. It will multiply the spell effects three times per day, and it has a short list of spells. Yeah. One of them is Fireball. Oh. <laughs> times 20. Oh, jeez. So if you roll 8 dice 6, you roll... And Rick and I had a discussion about... 60 d6. No. No. You roll your 8 dice 6, that number... Times, times 20. 20. Because of the way that the oh, rules are written, right. it says uh, this times. Right. Jeez. So it's mm-hmm. not... 20 dice 6. Nope. Nope. <laughs> it's that number times 20. So, and Cone of Cold was another one, and Lightning Bolt was another Shatter one. Shatter was one, wasn't it? Shatter was one. I There's like Magic Missile would have been him. Magic Missile. <laughs> 30 <laughs> Magic Missiles. There's like six spells, and it can only do three a day. Yeah. So you had to be very choosy. And uh, there was a time when we ran up to the gates of hell, and all these demons were coming out, mm-hmm. thousands of them, and there were like four of us. And like, we gotta get out of here. We're about to die and like be eaten. Mm-hmm. And my character goes, "Okay, I'm doing this." I had a wand of uh, cone of cold, oh. and I had a wand of uh, ice storm. Oh man, cone of cold, ice storm. I guess cold of cold. But I, I just kept going back and forth. And I said, "Okay," and three of those are times twenty. Right. <laughs> and Rick said, "Okay." I said, one of the other players 
He says, what do we hear? He says, when you're listening, you no longer hear an army of demons rushing forward. That's good. What you do hear is, jingle bells. <laughs> As it is now it's literally snowing. snowing in hell. A yeah. portion of hell froze over. A portion. <laughs> a portion. There you go. By that door. <laughs> we were able to get the hell out of it. So you're just being a nice guy, Dad. You're trying to get people on hell ice water. Yeah. <laughs> They had it briefly. <laughs> sure. Briefly. Uh, that was the best day in hell in centuries. <laughs> but that magic item is in the Egg of the Phoenix. And any DM out there that plays that, I caution you because they will find that magic item. Yeah, they will. Oh, no, they will find a way to break your game with that magic item. Oh, they will. It's, yeah. It happens immediately. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, you're like, oh my God, look at this thing. <laughs> oh, I put it on. Is it just a brooch? Yeah. It's pretty. What do we do with pretty? Yeah. You're a pretty, pretty princess. <laughs> pretty princess. And at the time when we found it, we're like, well, you can't, you can, as a magic user, you can read, write, detect, and identify magic. Yeah, your four basics of magic. Right, but you have to sit down and study yeah, and, and do it. it. Yeah. You can't just go, oh, what's this? Yes. Oh, okay, well, that's this. Detect magic. Oh, glasses of seeing. No, that's not. Yeah. Right. You have to spend time doing it. Well, we didn't have time. And we're going through this thing. And like, oh, well, that's an expensive magic item. That, you know, can't detect yeah. magic, magic. Okay, it's magic. And you know, other people are grabbing up all the cash and other things. I says, okay, anybody really want this? And like, it's a magic brooch. No, but in my mind, as a player, yeah. magic brooch would be some type of defensive item. Yeah, magic, like, like a magic reflection or like or protection or like an illusion, armor, right? Yeah. Because the body we found it on, it was being used as a cloak. Pit. Oh, yeah. So I'm like, it's, it, I think it's some kind of protection. I'm going to put that on. Let's go. And like four rooms later, I do lightning. <laughs> I cast lightning on all this stuff. And the room just explodes. <laughs> and like everybody stops, turns around, looks at me. You want to explain this? <laughs> it's like that time you get chain lightning in Skyrim the first time. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, nice. What the hell was that? <laughs> Maybe this did something? <laughs> You shouldn't have yeah. called out by the power of Grayskull. By the power of Grayskull. <laughs> There's so many people doing that. We're playing Greyhawk. Oh, man. Especially if you have any kind of adventure in Castle Greyhawk. Or in the City of Skulls. Mm -hmm. well, no, 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 not, not there. At that point, you want to be shit yeah, out. Be by the power of the City of Skulls. <laughs> but in Castle Greyhawk, I mean, there's so many people. Well, but, no, so it's kind of like the <laughs> people will yell out the Leroy! like shut up. Yeah, yes, yes, don't do that. After a while, yeah. like no, no more of that, no more of that. So uh, we talked touched on it a little bit earlier in terms of the the canonical history of the setting of Greyhawk. Um, what I was able to find was about fifteen to almost twenty thousand years worth of yeah. history. Uh, one of the things that's interesting here is the glossography canonically is written in like nine sixty something, but right. all of the game material happens in five. 570s so you're like there's a 400 information from the future <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> i was hoping you weren't going to figure that one out because yes a lot of the material mm -hmm. in game adventures they'll say it takes place in common year or whatever yeah and the world setting i think is written this is what happens from those four to five hundred years yeah this is here's your adventure so you're playing towards this as an end right and, and at least but a, then here comes the warps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, never mind. Yeah. Um, which changed that map completely. So, <laughs> uh, but some of the things that are, are really interesting is um, here we should talk about that original table. Because when you start to look at some of these things, uh, you get these names like Zagig Yagren, Lord Mayor of Greyhawk. Like, well, hold on. Zagig, that sounds kind of funny. And you come to find out as you as you research these characters, that was Gary Gygax's freaking character. Yeah. Who ends up becoming the mad uh, mayor of Greyhawk, building the dungeon under the city or castle Greyhawk. Which, by the way, when you, if you survive to make it to the bottom floor of this, you meet him. And he's just sitting there like a crazy person. Um, but you, you started getting into this stuff. So here's another one in uh, 339 Common Year. So Gig your grain inherits the titles of Landgriff of uh, Selenton and Despot of Harby. That's his title, is Despot. <laughs> like, yeah, that's not that's not like one you really want. Yeah. Um But they're all over the place. Like Tavish the Blackguard makes the Waysland Proclamation. You know? 
um, there's Zagig again in 351. Relinquish is the title. I mean, just... Um, so some of the ones that I went looking after yeah. were some of the big names that later went on to become published as creators of spells or magic items. Yeah, so this would such be... Such as Tensor, who was a wizard played by Gary Gygax's son. Yeah. Ever hear of Tensor's floating disc? Yeah, that guy. Uh, I think Nyron was one of them. I, yeah, Nyron. Uh, so another one, Morton Kanan. Let's see. I think I've heard of him. Name sounds a little familiar. I he's only got that Tome of Foes, some bald guy. I don't know. <laughs> so Morton Kanan was, it says here, perhaps Gygax's most famous character is also his favorite. Originally was created in 1973. The name drawn from Finnish mythology in Finland. Mm -hmm. Due to constant play, often <clears throat> with Rob Klutz as DM, Gygax advanced Morton Kanan into a very powerful character. He never revealed exactly how powerful Morgan Canyon was, simply stating that the wizard had 20-something levels. Even years after he last played Morgan Canyon, he would not disclose any of Morgan Canyon's powers or possessions. Various spells from first edition bear, bears his name. Morgan Canyon's Faithful Hound, Morgan Canyon's Lubrication, Morgan Canyon's Sword, Morgan... on and on. Yeah, so the guy was busy. We talked a little bit about that in our Through the Ages series where we were talking about there, there are rules in the first and second edition that allow you to go beyond uh, the published tables. Yes. And so to have beyond level 20 um, it's was not, not, not necessarily uncommon, but it, well, so, so it could be achieved, rather. Because you did lose a lot of characters well, early well, on in the early edition. So remember, though, in Gary Gygax's basement, there was a game a day that went on for hours in his house. Yeah. Every day they were playing Indian in his house. Yeah. So if you survive, Eight people, yeah, you could advance very quickly. But uh, so the, we didn't get the concept of like epic levels until third edition. Three five gave us right. epic levels up to forty. Well, uh, the, that, the original white box set, it it said uh, it was a ninth or twelfth level. You're expected to build a fortress, and then if you're going over that, every so many levels is another one of these. Yeah, so and it, then it they the, they were open ended in the white box. As right. Well. Yeah. So you could go on and on. But I mean, if you want check to. that out on YouTube, guys. That's at, at I want to be a GM. Our through the ages series, um, really interesting stuff. If you haven't seen any of the content uh, for older Dungeons and Dragons specifically, it was definitely a different game than what we see in Fifth Edition. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we've covered uh, all of the editions all the way through um, the original, all the way through yeah, Fifth so Edition, all of the different. Yep. Yeah. So Big B, ever hear of Big B? Yeah. Crushing hand and uh, his oh. fortress, and I mean, I, I like if I could. When you go to the Magic Emporium, you go to his shelf. I mean, you're like, I want to scroll on that and scroll on that. <laughs> so, Bigby started life as an evil wizard, non, non player evil. character. Uh, Rob Kuntz, uh, Dungeons of Greyhawk, Gary Gygax playing Mordekainen, subdued him and forced Bigby to become his servant. Seduced him. Subdued. Oh, he's not a bard. He's, not, he's, not, he's not a bard. <laughs> so, uh, Melf, again. Guy Melf, Gax, that's an arrow. Uh, yeah. Well. Played by Guy Gax's son, uh, another son. Um, Melf was also a name level, named for different things, such as Melf's acid arrow. Mm -hmm. So, that was probably his number one right there. So, Rary. Yep. I have a module here somewhere. I think it's your brown one. Merklands. Anyway, there's an adventure here by Rary the Trader. Rary was a wizard created by Brian Bloom, played only until he reached third level, at which point he retired the character, having reached his obje objective, which was to be able to cast medium rare. <laughs> medium rare. Guy guys borrowed the name for different spells, such as Rary's uh, mnemonic enhancer and oh uh, yeah. Bond. So one of the things that's interesting as we get through all this, as we get into the history. Um, so there was, uh, did they call them the Circle of Seven? The, the, the core of the adventurers. And the we see, of eight. well, there yeah, was the core of seven. Uh, the Circle became of eight. Well, the Circle of Eight is specifically the wizards. And yes. they established themselves as neutral force to maintain balance between good and evil in the world of Greyhawk. Um, yeah. so the Company of Seven, an adventuring group whose members later achieved great fame and power in the world of Orth. While they were together, the company explored many worlds and planes, some previously unknown. 
Several of the company became demigods or hero deities, and all of the company have spells and magic items named after them. So, uh, in C, so 318CY, this is definitely way before the, the, the published timeline, uh, or not published timeline, but where you would expect to play as, a, as an adventurer in the published modules. Uh, the company discovered the last Flan Citadel of Valeros and returned with a wagon load of wondrous treasures. Um, but then, um, so the members of the company were Sigig Yagrain. There he is again. Uh, Kegelthom. Merlion Nolzer. We've seen him in a few different places as, mm -hmm. through D&D. Quail, uh, Heward, and Tasha, uh, who we now have as someone who's come forward through D&D as well with a lot of spells uh, named after that character. Tasha's uncontrollable hideous laughter. Yeah. I love that one. Yeah, man. Uh, and that. what's interesting here, I'll, I'll read this, uh, Tasha's story has evolved with Dungeons & Dragons. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, Tasha, a young apprentice wizard with a morbid sense of humor. <clears throat> Through the few live know it, Tasha was actually the legendary archmage known today as Igliv, who went on to become the Witch Queen of Fairland, Mother of Ayuz, <laughs> which is Mama, yeah, <laughs> and sometime lover of the Demon Prince, Graz, when she feels like it. But, you know, just get your little summoning circle, summon a booty call. So you have, but that—that that was the original Tasha. Was mm -hmm. ended up being a the Witch Queen of Fairland, uh, probably a a demigod herself, or in that level of power. She gave birth to one, so yeah, yeah. And then we've got I use. Um, but when you see Tasha, um, particularly fifth edition, um, Tasha's guide to everything. Her story in there is a little bit different, mm -hmm. and so she's evolved with Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Let me read this one. There's a module called Return of the Eight, set yeah. in the world setting in the Greyhawk. So this was interesting. At, at, at a certain point, so we got Rory the Traitor. Mm -hmm. A couple of the are, these mages are, are killed in this upset, and uh, the, the Circle of Eight has to be reformed to reestablish its order. It begins the night. A dragon falls on an off-duty adventurer. Brave adventurer. I didn't know we had duties. Like, was yeah. I supposed to be punching a time card? Like, Fortunately, <laughs> it's a small dragon. Unfortunately, it's connected to a very big problem. Make that a huge problem. The survival of a well-known wizard belonging to the Circle of Five is at stake. Mm -hmm. But that's not the worst of it. Evil forces are attempting to infiltrate this secret fortress and unlock vast magical power, and that's not the worst of it. The bad news? Some old enemies of civilizations in the flat S have returned. They discovered a mutual interest in world domination. Oh man, the they have, layers. And you know, have a plan to bring it about. Their plan is already underway, and when the little dragon appears, worse on this particular night, there's no one who can stop them. No one but any heroes who start an adventure and survive through its out this world's climax. They have no choice. For if they fail, the city Greyhawk and all civilized lands in the Fenness will meet some remarkable legendary figures. And then civilization will die screaming. Yeah. Well, you know what the worst oh. thing about? So, like, if, oh, go. So you and, me, you and me hook up, right, because we have a mutual interest in world domination. You know what the problem there is? Mm -hmm. Only one of us can rule the world. That's, that's true. <laughs> that's, a, that's a later problem. Yeah, that's, and now we have a now problem. And that's a, later a future problem. Mr. Producer issue. That's yeah. <laughs> also, stop trying to hook up. <laughs> so back off. Um, so definitely, the cultures um, very much good versus evil as themes and things oh, of that absolutely. nature, and we see that through the histories absolutely. as um, you know the rise of evil, the the, the defeat of evil, well, and it keeps. But to me, this, it's this just one of the things forth. that makes it so much fun. Yeah. Because why Star Wars so much fun to play? It's the good versus evil. It's a good game. versus evil, and everybody loves shooting stormtroopers. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and it's the same kind of thing in, in Greyhawk, in the world setting Greyhawk. You know who you're fighting for, and at the start of the adventure, there's always a very clear why are you fighting for. For sure. So because an old man that's being carried by six skeletons just came into your city with a horde of undead cavalry. Yeah, we shoot him. Yeah, yeah, that's how that works. That's so, right. <laughs> let's take a second here. We've gotten, covered quite a lot of ground with Greyhawk. And uh, check in with our viewers, see if we've got any comments or questions we might have missed there. Uh, that's in a different screen. Yeah, good. Yeah, <laughs> don't, 
Mr. Producer, go to the bottom row of icons. Yep, I'm working on it. That is not the bottom row of icons. <laughs> it's the icons, right? Those are not icons. <laughs> I'm going to... Hold on. Oh, the body of Mr. Producer over here. You're looking for If anybody would like to put in an application, <laughs> you can run uh, cameras for us. Uh, that was not the right. We're willing to pay you double what we pay him. So, hey... We, oh, there we go. Cool. So we've got Beast over here. Looks like on the um, the channel with us. Uh, class, to have you, Beast. Good to see you again. Hope everything's going good for you. Um, what's he got to say there, Mr. Producer? Uh, looks like he's hitting on somebody's sister. What? Do what? It says, "Hey, sis, you awake?" Isn't a common pickup line in Georgia. <laughs> no, that's your fault, Mr. Producer. <laughs> if anyone's going, my sister, it's going to be me. Uh so I'm going to get in chat for some reason, me in chat on my phone. That's uh, all good. So, anyway. So, hi, Beast. Good to see you. Thank you very much. We got Morton Caney. We got Bigby. We got Melf. We got Rary. We just talked a little bit about John, John Midge. He was a wizard by Jim Ward. He's another one of the contributing editors. Mm -hmm. Guy Gags borrowed his name from magical spells, such as Draw Midge, Instant Summons. And then the Circle of Eight. Yep. The Circle of Eight at the point where Gygax's own characters in the Greyhawk home campaign had collectively accumulated both enough wealth that they couldn't easily spend it, and standing army that rivaled most nations. He gathered all eight of the characters, Morton Kanan, Rag, Bigby, Rigby, Zigby, I'm guessing they're related somehow, Phil North, Graham, and Vin, I guess they're related as well, together as a circle of eight, pooling their resources, Gygax had the eight construct a stronghold in the middle of an evil land so that they would not have to travel far to find adventure. <laughs> how convenient is that? I'm just going to build our castle in the middle this of the This is how MI6 has failed. They need to build an outpost <laughs> at every uh, volcano that says potentially I got a layer. And so they literally just like walk outside. Well, judo chop a henchman. Do you remember? <laughs> I forget what it was. There was some movie where this guy was literally buying a supervillain hideout from this guy that was like selling supervillain layers, and like to the point where there were still dead henchmen in the volcano super, like the super layer. <laughs> yeah, the last. Yeah, there were, like pools of blood and dead henchmen over there while this guy's walking around talking to the the re um, the real estate agent. That sounds like a retired bard that's just going into the house time stairs <laughs> now. Is. I've got a deal for you. Yes, like, <laughs> Listen, I know you're a super villain, and you know super villains need a lot of power, right? Well, this is a volcano, geothermal for free. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so sure. What I, I want to point out, though, so in expensive. the original white box, mm -hmm. it, they tell you in there that your character by ninth to twelfth level, depending on class, it should build a fortress and start getting your own people to work for it. Yeah, build your own small army of one cut of whatever suits. Mm -hmm. Gygax had eight that had reached and surpassed that level. Oh, yeah. Because he may mention there were the one guy says, oh, he's 20th, <clears throat> he's 20th level something. Or something. So oh. I would assume that all eight of them were 20th level something. And as a DM slash player, was just looking for a way to get them away from the game so that they were no longer controlling the game. Because if you have right. a game and one of those characters shows up, well, who's in charge? Right. Okay, you're going to tell Morgan Keenan he can't be in charge? No. I'm right. going to ask him if he needs me to carry his luggage. <laughs> it, when he says, I think this is the solution to your problem. But carries all yeah. Do you know what you call a 20th level wizard? Whatever he wants you to. <laughs> and that makes a lot of sense from a game standpoint. And it was nice to see where they took those characters, um, you know, honored their legacy and the world building and established them <clears throat> to go further into uh, Dungeons and Dragons lore, the world of Greyhawk. Um, and, and beyond from there. So, I just really like World of Grail. Mm -hmm. It's it's almost my favorite. <laughs> when we when we uh, talk a little bit more from um, the world building standpoint, we've kind of touched on governments. Um, very much feudal kings and queens. We don't have uh, democracies and things like that. You might have a mayor in a town. Um, on the wild coast, there are five city states. Each of them have a mayor or some type of. Um, uh, I think there's two that have a council, but they all have some type of other government yeah. other than a king. Like, like a local and, city. And they're, they're unique 
to the setting in that regard. They are, they are, yes. Yeah, because everything is, is uh, dictator, despot, king, you know, um, you might have a theocracy or theocratic bend, but they're all that, that old-style European... Fact, some of the names of the places kind of give it away, such as Kingdom of Keelan. Yes, they have a king. So then you have another <laughs> one that's the Principality of... Listen to the guy principality of Uluk. So they have a principal, but they also have a superintendent. The prince. Principality is done by a prince. So, and the Duchy of Uluk is done by a duke. And then you have a county, and that's done by a countess. So even some of the lands uh, tell you who's in charge of. Like I use. <laughs> that's all it says. It just says I use there. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, they don't have it. They just, he's up there. He don't go there. <laughs> yeah, their, their tourist industry is, is uh, hurting as a baby. But, but it, it'll be, um, it's nice in that it's, it's fairly well understood, fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. King, queen, royal family, done. Um, versus some of the more complex um Systems that you'll see in Faerun, like Waterdeep, with its council and mayor. And oh, like even thing. like the crime syndicates and how they're all connected to the local well, government. That, that all builds up some of the, it will flesh out specific areas, particularly when you get into the city of Greyhawk. It has all of those features as well, like you'll see in Waterdeep. It's not necessarily that's something you'll need to worry about in the world at large. No, but, but I, would we'll count it, I would count it with governments and commerce. For sure, and, and those are things you'll need to pay attention to. For your local area you know and you'll see that when you get into a module True. um so one of the the primary modules one of the introductory modules written by gary himself uh was for the city of homlet h-o-m-l-e-t-t -T, almost like an omelet but somebody put an h in front of it <laughs> um but it's it it details the npcs the government the surrounding area of that starting city and then the problems that they're facing so Particularly in this era where we had a lot of this, these modules and pre-printed material that we could go run games from, uh, you had a lot of those details that would be fleshed out for you, um, and it was enough that you needed, okay, how, okay, the town can run, the, the adventurers don't have to do it all, and they know who to talk to to get, get some information or get a job, uh, and those were the things that were of import, and it keeps the setting fairly light and easy to play, like, you don't have a whole lot of need to figure out this or that, you have more, I need to go and solve the problem, which uh, lends itself to that, that really nice high adventure aspect that themes you'll see in Greyhawk. I think we're down to commerce. We yeah. kind of hit on commerce a little bit well, earlier we with the map. Yeah, so um, but I wanted to, we can bring it back now. So that was one of the things that was really cool, and I think that's actually in the other book here. So I do want to point out, but the, like the different countries will have a different form of commerce. Like, there's places where there are pirates, and there's also a land up there called uh, Scarred Brotherhood. And there, a entire land is uh, dominated by uh, thieves and assassins. Right, well, the Scarred Brotherhood Bandits. was an assassin guild that yeah. grew to enough power to conquer enough territory right. to, to be in charge of. So, so they just disappeared the government? Well, it is said that an order of monastic religious militarists was founded long ago on the remote plateau south of the city of Crow Trella. This order is purposed to espouse the cause of the Salus as the rightful rulers of all the planets. So they're religious, military, solaristic zealots. And so, yeah, they, they mm -hmm. that's the Scarlet Brotherhood. Oh, the Scarlet Brotherhood, yeah. So, yeah, they their goal is to then reestablish the, the rightful rule mm -hmm. in their eyes. Um, and as you can see, they cause lots of problems with that. <laughs> um, I'm trying to get to... So it's a good thing they're down there. Yeah. I also want to point out the Bandit Kings, we do a map of the Bandit Kings, they have a large canyon. It's kind of like the Grand Canyon, but it's also said to be a direct route to uh, the Abyss. Mm -hmm. Hey, one of those are in Neverwinter. So, yeah. one of, so from time to time, depending on how aggravated the DM gets with the party, there may or may not be demons and other things coming. Oh, you guys want a Balrog? Here's a Balrog. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah. yeah, so here we are, regional products. Um, this is nice, and it's um, one of the things that really puts that forefront as, as something that needs to be considered as your characters are traveling across the land. Um, it also helps if you're trying to, you know, say you got this information and you wanted to have kingdoms start a war or have a border skirmish or something. Uh, maybe that's not combat-related for the characters as a, as a problem to solve. Um, 
these these regional products we've got food cloth copper silver gold gems ivory lumber furs electrum platinum spices rare woods uh, none and unknown and so that's all done by region and um, you can can be the impetus for for why people uh, would want to go and and cause problems with their neighbors. They have something that we want or need, uh, particularly after the, the wars from the ashes. Uh, if your industry was destroyed, but they've got what you, you need, you might have to go and get it, you know. Um, early D&D &D had a lot of different currencies. So uh, we had copper, silver, gold, platinum, electrum, and gems, um, six different kinds of currency. but they, uh, across the setting, were fairly universal. Now, you could still have coins that were minted uh, from different places that yep. could add some story flavor and provide some hooks there for your party. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about that once before with... Um... Uh, it's something that comes up uh, every time a little bit. So um, the, the big one was uh, Ravenloft, right? Yeah, having it, different kinds of money. Right, and uh, so they didn't necessarily use gold coins, but silver had yeah. a bigger... Um, importance to the people and then those mermaids used um pearls that didn't really care for much else right um and so you may find regional differences of that still in greyhawk but as far as money went it was largely uniform um and so it was, it was there as sort of as a you know we need this to have an economy but it wasn't it, as far as a feature of the the game setting it wasn't something that added much complication in, in, in one of these, it talks about the different, uh, uh, if you're in this land, gold is more valuable. It doesn't really say, it doesn't give you a number. Like, right. this gold is equal to five platinum. It doesn't say like that. It'll just say gold is more valuable. Uh, or yeah. gold is not a mineral that they locally have, so it is more valuable to them. Yeah, that'll be, I think, in the next couple of pages we're yeah, going to talk it, about. It talks uh, about some of those. But there's, but there's also a... A general um, a table somewhere in one of these. So it's a gold is worth twenty silver. Oh, the five, conversion rate. Yeah. One gold is uh, you know five platinum. There's so many gold, and there's that table. And I wrote that down on a card, and uh, it's very helpful, especially when you're in a city and your adventurers are trying to buy a bread and an ale. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I have said, forty pounds of gold from the goblins I just yeah, murdered. I'm okay, like, well, I need like. like gold. I need um, a copper for this beer. Yeah, like, two, <laughs> two copper for lunch and a beer. And I, and I, I don't have any copper. I got 40 pounds of gold. Yeah, like you I could platinum uh, instead. It's like, well, I could buy food for a year with this. How, how I about did a that, bag of gems? I did that to my party. Um, Jake wanted to purchase a, a spell book, right? So I was like, yeah, I'll sell you a spell book, three silver. And he's like, well, all I have is gold. He's like, I'll gladly take a gold. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so. And he only took one gold. Yeah. That wow. guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That dude just made a killing. It's like, it's like he told you the whole encyclopedia Britannica. So <laughs> you can do that. Uh, uh, what's, the, what's the old saying? Uh, a fool and his money are soon parted. Oh, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> everybody that's that is in business to make money, if they if yeah. somebody comes in that's a, an idiot like that, like hey. And be sure and tell all your friends about yeah. me. Well, no, I said I more. I said it so matter of fact. Like Jake just looked at me. He was like, "Yeah, I'll take a gold." And he just looked at me. and He's like, "I bet you would." <laughs> well, here's something to note about commerce, particularly if you're going to take these this setting. Uh, and there's a lot of good information for game masters that are moving this forward into fifth edition. Um, one of the the features of first and second edition was converting gold found into experience points for your character. Yes, and so sir, you know, sometimes you'll find a lot of extra treasure or experience point value, uh, like magic items and things, um, that the party's not necessarily going to take, but they'll they'll take it for experience points. So if you're moving this into fifth edition, you're like, man, they just handed out treasure left and right all over the place. It could definitely upset a fifth edition economy because the XP <laughs> for gold feature is not part of fifth edition. It, it's it's not, and um, I used to try to downplay that some. Yeah, <clears throat> and I tried to up, up play, role play. So if you're role playing your character and you do something that is um, really exceptional, mm -hmm. great moment that everybody at the table enjoyed it. I definitely want to give you some extra points for playing. Sure. 
And, and yours is the mindset for where the game developed into. So the earlier stuff was very dungeon fall, right? So go oh, yeah. in, kick the door down, defeat the goblins, Absolutely. count the dollars, right. you get your XP, and then you move on. But what I would do with the treasure value, so I would keep track of how much treasure they found and what the gold piece value of it was. And then you do your math, and I would take that gold, or gold piece part of the experience points mm -hmm. And add that to the experience points total. Yeah, the pot for that party. For the pot for the party, for completing the dungeon, monsters killed, mm -hmm. saving the princess, you know, all all of it. Yeah, and, and, and so you get so many points, you get so many points, you get so many points. And then I would give role playing bonus. Right. I'm gonna give you 1,500 points for role playing that thing you did in that room. That everybody enjoyed. I'm gonna give you 800 experience points for role playing that thing that you did with your archer. Right, and that helps to encourage people. And then you get them. They're, they're adding up. They're furiously adding up. <laughs> I, need, I need 200 more points. Yeah. You need 200 more points? Um, what if you donated some of that treasure to the local orphanage? How much do you need to donate? <laughs> About 200 gold pieces yeah. worth. Uh, yeah, so it's just one of the things you'll see with the older material. Because first and second edition definitely did a basically a one-for-one -one gold piece to experience point. Um, you won't find that in our later editions, so... Uh, if you do use this material, be sure you read it so you're familiar with it and uh, make sure that the treasure found is going to be more in line with your game and your world setting yeah. or, um, mm -hmm. so that you don't end up with, you know, chest after chest of gold that the, no physical way to possibly carry it um, in a setting or in a system that was designed to basically cash it in to level up. So I would also caution you uh, as a game master when you're writing your adventure, don't put a whole lot of treasure in it. And don't put a whole lot of magic in it. Every magic item and spell that you give them will come back to haunt you yeah. someday. They're going to use it against you 100% of the time. I got a plus four purple sword! Yeah! That's why I give them a, a ring of wishes. Stop it. <laughs> yeah, because they don't know what it is. And then you make the uh, item powerful enough so that if they try to um, identify it, the ring resists the identification. And then you just have somebody make a random wish at some point, or you just listen for your players to let it slip. I wish, oh, I wish we could do this. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just you being a jerk. Cause you're a jerk. And it's funny. It is funny. <laughs> I, this little girl walks by in the street. I wish I had a puppy. Bam. You're not, you are now a puppy. You're not just a puppy. You're that little girl's puppy, and you love her unconditionally. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. But I think we know why people don't play your game very long. Because <laughs> they're all dead? They're all, dead. <laughs> all puppies? They're all dead or puppies. Yeah. <laughs> they're dead puppies. <laughs> so that's that's sort of Greyhawk's commerce. Yeah, you're going to be dealing with different, uh, six different types of currency, but largely yeah. the same. Uh, so and pay attention to... There, there are trade roads yeah. that have caravans, and there are rivers that are used for trade commerce, and mm -hmm. there are ocean city ports that are used for commerce. Yeah, and but they're that, everywhere. Just, just like on any normal. Yeah, and those are detailed pretty well uh, yes. in here with maps, lines, and uh, just sort of showing those routes. Who trades what with who, um, and that, yeah. You know, particularly if you're trying to move the players from one place to another, you know, trade caravans, hitching a ride on a boat, those sorts of things are a great way to do that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, magic versus technology. We touched on it just a little bit. Um, before we do that, let's check back with our viewers. Which is going to be yeah, over here. One. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> I did them. I'm sure we're having a hard time with technology. But if you're with us, we... Well, well no, it's because he's higher magic to lower technology. <laughs> uh, I'm good sure. <laughs> yeah. well, 1970s says it was true. <laughs> the 1920s? Like the toad. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, if you're out there, we appreciate it. If you have some questions, let us know. Um, but this is one of those uh, things where we definitely have a lower technology level than what you'd expect in a lot of other D and D settings. Yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely pre Renaissance. See, it, yeah. it seems more Dark Ages. It's not. It's, yes, boats are not Spanish galleons, and no. we've got a lot of those trade barges and that sort of stuff. Right. Yeah, you're very much uh, in the Dark Ages, pre Renaissance. Mm -hmm. um, so your even your mass armies are not that well equipped, right? You know, a lot of peasant conscripts. A lot of peasants conscripts. What else are you gonna do with peasants? Well, strip them. <laughs> <laughs> you can strip them and uh, go make them fight in a war for you. Oh, when you're trying to uh, crush evil. But yeah. the peasants are revolting. Yes, they are. <laughs> so, yeah, very dark ages, pre-Renaissance, uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, there are a few 
isolated places like the Valley of the Mage where it's very, very heavy magic. Yeah. Because they have a university for magic users. It's probably and, and on top of a ley line or something. Well, up there. and that's that's what you could see. Like, think about turn of the turn of the century America, mm-hmm. right? The Industrial Revolution. The large cities and things had industry. It was very common. Uh, street cars, those sorts of things. But you get outside of that, and your horse and buggy, uh, donkey drawn mills. Absolutely. So, so when it, same thing with magic, right? You get into the cities and other things. It exists. It's out there, and you'll find it in higher concentrations in more populous areas. But you get out into the woods and things like that. Um, Rangers, for example, in the setting don't have magic at all. As compared to 5th edition where they're in Faerun, uh, they draw more upon uh, nature and the magic yeah, of nature. Yeah, almost a druidic kind of spell casting. And very similar to, um, but that, that just goes to highlight the differences, the lower level, the, more, the rarity of magic. Uh, we do tend to see that in the Greyhawk in particular, magic is more potent for it. Oh yeah, it's mm-hmm. uber powerful. Yeah, it can be. You, yeah. Like, there's some, like, world-ending devices. <laughs> um, particularly there's there's higher... a lot of magic items and spells in the hardback book yeah. that came out. This came out a few years after the World Center. Mm-hmm. And, and so they added a bunch of unique spells and unique magic items. Yeah, and magic was one of the things that saw a lot of the development. So we've got, uh, behind somewhere, uh, or maybe back them up, but we had the Encyclopedia Magical. Over here. And, and the Spells Compendium. Yep, over here. Yeah, um... So there's and all four, the three three spells, there's three books of priest spells, three, four books of wizard spells, four books of the uh, Encyclopedia Magica. And three clerk. Yeah, and then that's not to say that if, you, as a game master, you weren't borrowing material from things like GURPS and their magic settings. Yes, yep. I was uh, up there. Right. <laughs> uh, yes, I do. <laughs> for sure. Um, or two things even, even if you were still playing in second edition and around 2000 with the launch of third edition, when they start to... Um, get new ideas and further develop magic and things like that. But uh, in, in my game, I started running uh, a long time ago. And so for, for several years, so we had a lot of experienced players at my table. Mm-hmm. And I mean players that have been playing for 10 years or more. Right. And so I couldn't just bring out a book and, oh, yeah, say, hey, here's, <laughs> and try, to, try to describe a monster or a magic item or the specs of a spell because mm-hmm. they knew it. So yeah. I started grabbing stuff out of GURPS and out of Millennium magic items and spells mm-hmm. and hit it with something and they go what the hell is that <laughs> i'm like exactly because it put it in their mind if you live here and you travel there do you know every single spell that they know yeah they have a different take on magic they have a different take on magic but also their catalog is completely different. You're using the Sears catalog. They're using the J.C. Penny catalog. Give me West. Well, so not only that, but like, let's, if you wanted to uh, have a more direct um, comparison to Earth history and culture, right? So you can look at the way that magic was looked at in the Indian culture versus how magic was looked at in the um, Celtic. Culture. Yeah, like in Nordic, right? So like theirs is very very different where they're having like more show uh, like shaman type rituals when they're trying to like you know convene with well, the nature spirits all, and that kind all, of stuff well that was that's what the point i was making the end yeah when you cross that county line when you cross that country line you're in another country yeah now. you know india has it's their gods whereas you know the nords had their wood spirits and, and they're going to be <laughs> different and so your spells are different your magic items are different mm-hmm. and i carried that into my planescape campaign oh, yeah. and i use a lot of palladium and a lot of gurps in there to hit him with magic items and spells, and it was hilarious mm-hmm. because, they're like, in Planescape, they explain to you now you're traveling planes of existence. Yeah. Well, that wand of magic missiles you have, it don't work no more because you are in this point. Or instead of magic missile, it cast bubbles. Or yeah. It cast fireball. Yeah. Instead of <laughs> weird stuff. Well, um, or it just explodes in your hand when you yeah. try to use it. Yeah, that's always fun. Not Roll on the table. <laughs> ah! But um, it's definitely a medium to low magic setting where magic is available but your magic users had a a different sort of status not everybody has access to magic or magic effects and so when you're when you're out there as a wizard or uh some of the earlier ones were very cool thief illusionists or, or fighter magic users um those characters stood apart because of their ability to use magic and the way that that allowed them to interact with the world yeah i think so just recently when we we're doing this, we also wanted to look at 5th edition's version of uh, Greyhawk and the world setting. And just this morning we we're looking on the websites. We can't find it anymore on 
Uh, Wizards of the Coast. Well, then there's no official Wizards of the Coast 5e, but there is a lot of um, fan and, and community 5e conversions available. So the fact that it is uh, middle to, I wouldn't say real low, but just under middle yeah. level of magic. Definitely more than Dark Sun. I, if it was a stake, more than Dark, more than Dark Sun, yeah. less than Fabian. Well, if it were yeah. a stake, we're kind of calling it medium to medium rare. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so. But typically, typically, a fifth edition game has a lot of magic. Almost everybody has some kind of spell or cantrip or something they're going to be cast. Yeah, and for sure, the action economy in fifth edition is uh, quite a lot different as well. So you know, where my full round action might be, I'm going to go ahead and cast a spell, and and you know, the action economy in fifth edition is like action, reaction, bonus action, and so you got quite a lot more things going off at your your poor little goblins. Yeah, um, it can make make it uh, quite a bit more interesting. Um, and like I mentioned earlier. Certain classes of spellcasting did not exist at this level of game, and so there's there's no analog for them in the setting. Uh, sorcerers and warlocks, as an example, they just they weren't they weren't around at this point. They don't exist. There's no analog for them. It doesn't mean that you couldn't bring those characters into the setting or have players at, at with those classes. Um, just know that when you're looking at the material, um, those things weren't understood. They weren't you know it, it's all from the perspective of uh, wizards and and what would they call it at the time magic users. Yeah, you may have to make some type of adjustment in your story to accommodate more magic you know, in within the yeah. game. Now, I will say that um, Greyhawk is ripe for warlocks. Oh, there are sure. uh, demons and devils that are are involved in the hierarchies of some of these nations. Well, <laughs> there's that Not guy who became a I mean, God, we're like... always talking about well so that's that's Aserac. <laughs> like... um yeah Aserac and vecna yeah those are some of the ancient evils that exist but i'm talking about li literal devils and demons yep. that are uh, affecting different portions of the world um mm -hmm. that would gladly give you some power for a bit uh oh, that's, that's so, not like yeah. prefer to work yeah i'm gonna give you some power so you can run off and get in trouble for doing whatever it is i want you to do yeah and we'll, you know, I'll we'll wind you up and send you off like a little ticking bomb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to directly get involved because then I get blind. Because when you die, I get your soul. So I'm going to give you just enough power so you can go over and you think you can kill the troll, but really you can't. And then you're going to die and I get your soul and everybody's happy. For Except sure. for you because you're dead. And <laughs> that features in some of the things. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the classic modules because they're influential on in D&D as a whole. But the Temple of Elemental Evil. Yes. That and actually it, comes back twice. It come, it's been reprinted with a couple of modifications. But there's a demoness that is in the Temple of Elemental Evil, uh, it's causing such problems that, uh, before the adventurers get to it, an army is raised to go and fight the evil armies that have moved in there. We're talking uh, gnolls, orcs, goblins, those sorts of things, undead, and then evil humans. So you get this clash of armies, and they end up uh, destroying the temple. It's a four-layered level dungeon, partially collapsed, and they seal the demoness in the temple. Uh, so she's just like hanging out there. Do you think she wouldn't want to empower somebody to go ahead and, and you know, figure out how to unseal that, manipulate, oh, I, you know, whatever it happens to be. So there's, there's a lot of things like that in the world setting that would lend itself really well to a warlock. Um, not even necessarily as an evil character, but as somebody who might be manipulated um, unwittingly. Um, they're, they're just, even on the good side of things, where we have a lot of um, there are faith that are in different forests that deal uh, directly with some of the elves and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, sorcerer could exist as well. I think it would fit fine into the setting. Well, yeah, especially if you did like a um, sorcerer wizard cross because they already had magic user. Um, but we've also talked some about bringing fifth edition into other settings like what we did with Dragonlance. Yeah. So that was not too overly difficult. You just take your Greyhawk storyline and then your fifth edition rules. Well, certain events like where we deal with the bright desert that used to be the bright forest. Large cataclysmic magic battles like that tend to do weird things to the flow of mana yeah. as it's understood. Um, so, yeah, wild magic and, and um, that may be something we see even after the wars, depending on um, how you might modify that, and now there was more magic cataclysm or, or magic Yeah, like, like a wild magic sorcerer would be pretty cool, because right. like magic it, doesn't work as well, because things got blown up. And, and, and so what I'm saying is that the world setting um, 
has things there that you could use as justification to bring those classes over and establish those characters as part of the world without having to be like, oh yeah, they're just something, you know. Uh, it doesn't need to be uh, lost over. It can, it can definitely be rooted into the setting. Just know, though, like I mentioned, the setting um, had magic user and did not um, have sorcerer or warlock. Yeah, I think that's fine, though, because we could just take 5th edition and expand into it, because you would have magic user plus demons equals warlock. I just said that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> For sure, it's it's in there. But uh, so here we go. I want to talk. We were talking just a second about it. Uh, so monster types and some of the other threats. I don't uh, know if there's a whole lot of unique monsters oh, here, but, but there I know... are. There are some that are very uh, Greyhawk that um, we don't necessarily see a lot of in other settings. Uh, they will come up sometimes in some of those older modules that are updated. Let me see if I can find it. I had a list of like 10 that were. Set so, monsters and heat. Uh, here you go, Troy. Bully wigs. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've seen a bully wig outside of Greyhawk. <laughs> Yeah, no. I don't think I've heard anybody even talk of them in fifth edition. Uh, in fifth edition? I don't know what a bully you know wig what? is. <laughs> uh, that would be a no then. Yeah, so there we go. Uh, yeah, not everything that's. Not all the classic monsters have made it all the way through forward. No. Uh, particularly when. So. Uh, third edition, the default setting was over. Um, fourth edition had another setting that they tried to create. Uh, that didn't quite hit. Fourth edition itself kind of fell flat. But fifth edition established uh, Forgotten Realms as its default setting. So, right. if running another setting, we have fifth edition. Oh. Yeah. Not is it in Monsters of the Multiverse? Don't get, don't get too fast. Oh, we got him. Here he is. Frog people! Oh. There you go. Blue yeah. wings. Um, I, the... They're just not used a lot. Yeah. Um, you're not going to find them. Of course, there are frog people, so you're going to find them in, like, swamps and... Mm -hmm water environments. Yeah. But I remember earlier modules we were dealing with lizard men mm -hmm. and bullywigs would show up from time to time, maybe you'd get the odd Sahagin. And those were the guys that you kind of fight. Oh, I love Sahagins. Well you you'd fight those guys if you weren't fighting orcs, goblins, hobgoblins, or trolls. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like like these, a... these lizard and amphibian folk or your regular like orcs and stuff. So bullywigs, whenever I have to write a game that is for uh, kids Oh yeah, and, and you don't want to have anything really uber violent. You mm -hmm. know, to bring out, I don't want to bring out a bunch of orcs or a bunch of hill giants or mm -hmm. you know something, and you have a bloody mess. And yeah, the battle's yeah. going to be warfare. But you know, two or three bullywigs, and the kids are going to have fun with them because it's not really a scary monster. No, yeah, you it's, know, it's a it's a five four foot tall right. frog. And if I remember right, I don't know about in here, but you can. For what page are you on there? Uh, page thirty five in the monster manual. All right, so bullywigs. Uh, multi attack makes two melees. One is bite. So, yeah. We got a big old tongue. But that's not a bite. No. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that, yeah. that's that's part of the, the fun. They are a very unique monster, and it, it, uh, yeah, it's nice to see that they did come forward. But um, the feature in a lot of this, the different modules, the low level stuff in particular, mm -hmm. are in Greyhawk. Uh, so the next one here I got is a Juggernaut. Was um, <laughs> he's in here? Yeah. The, so Temple of Elemental Evil, the Tomb of Horrors, and Greyhawk Ruins. Yep. Yeah. Tomb of Horrors, uh, later known as Tomb of Annihilation. Well, here's here's the the messed up part about it. And Alex, if you're watching, um, this will be one for him. It is the mobile cousin of the mimic. Yes. Uh, just the name is enough to get a player's attention. Well, so, yeah. I think a juggernaut. Oh yeah. I think you and I have talked about that. Right. So he, he has mimics on, mimics on the brain. Yeah, uh, he he loves mimics. They're a cool monster for sure. Uh, so you're like, okay, I've got a chest. It sits there. It does whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, what if now it's a wardrobe? Uh, circa Beauty and the Beast, and that thing's coming over to get you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, any number of things there. Did uh, one that was a uh, uh stationary suit of armor. That was a juggernaut. Oh yeah, so, yeah like I did top on you. Well, <laughs> well, well, yeah. So what I did was like, okay, well, it's basically going to put itself on you. So how am I going to do that? Well, I was like, <laughs> the thing. 
Right? Yeah. Its chest opens up with the teeth, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the thing. Uh, we got another one here. Uh, Tyrg, T Y R G, uh, found out of Morton Kane's Fantastic Adventure. Um, and it is a cross between a tiger and a dog with a stunning howl. Oh, I yeah. didn't. Uh, so here's one that was brought in with Spelljammer, specific to Gray Space, is the Horde. Um, and that was found in some of the outlying planets. I was about to say, they're on a different planet, though. Yeah. Uh, so Is that the one that also has a drow planet? One of them had a drow planet. Um, I, th I think they did that in Gray Space to sort of expand on that. Uh, do they happen to be in there? Sorg? Yeah. H O R G? Correct. You don't see any. Again, that was, that was Gray Space. So we might be actually in the uh, Booze Astro Menagerie. Yeah, it's of those. Um, yeah. The Frog Hemoth. The Frog Hemoth? <laughs> From Expedition to Barrier Peaks. Oh, okay. That's one of the. I don't remember. Who, I think it's like on their first level or second level where they had the. Uh, as, as you go through the spaceship, they've got an area that's a, a menagerie with all these animals. And they've been there for a while, so they, they get out and they escape and yeah. they're mutated. They're hungry and feral. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a bad time when you get to that part of the. the the adventure is definitely got to be on your toes. Um, we had frog Um So man scorpions were, were brought out in Rary the Traitor as he that, makes his way through yeah. some of the desert. Wouldn't that book just be amazing if it was alphabetical? Well, I mean, it is, and then you have subclasses of a monster. Yeah. So, um, no, yeah, that one. The, the man's first, so, yeah, uh, what is it? So, uh, so the, I think the rock in the second mummy movie. Yes. Yeah. So that's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Because yeah, yeah. you know we have driders which are top man spiders. Yeah. Man spiders, yeah. and this is man scorpion. Yeah. Uh, some of the cave. Which is very different than scorpion man. Also yeah. like Batman. <laughs> yeah. Keep them separate. Yeah. For sure. Right, man. Uh, some cave fishers. We said we just spent a lot of time yeah. in dungeons, a lot of time <laughs> in the caves. I love those. I actually uh, ran. Uh, was it under mountain the other day? Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I that was getting chewed on by one of those. Yeah, they they feature in there, and they will. Uh, if you forget to look up, yep. they will get you. They will get you. Uh, well, so they have a they have a, a DC twenty perception check because they just look like stalactites. So, little brother, to your point on the last one we were talking about, um, as we're getting to Dragonlance, monsters are bad. Named monsters oh, yeah. <laughs> are their own thing, right? So not an NPC, but a named monster. Uh, thank you, I use yep. from the ashes here. Sorry. Uh, Thassalos. Yeah, yeah. A, That's a Dracolich, right? It's a bone golem. Bone golem, so, yeah. Yeah, he's a... Uh, so he's a bone, it's a Dracolich. Well, well, I'll be talking about him in a second here. Uh, and then a Bodak. Um... From the lost cabins of Sogana. Um, but th those are the, some of the monsters that you I, we don't run into, um, but they've been featured in a lot of the different adventures you're going to find in Greyhawk. So that was pretty cool. And then I've got some interesting information here. Flip them up. All right. Yeah, so. Asarak, if you guys uh, have been playing D and D five E for a long time, the Tomb of Annihilation was their first big book, and so that is Asarak. Asarak was originally written by Gary Gygax, and uh, we found him as the main antagonist in the Tomb of Horrors module, and that was later uh, modified into the Tomb of Annihilation. Yeah. He was just a normal lich back then, though. Well, it, there's a lot of things that go on with him for sure. I've got both of them around here somewhere. Yeah, but uh, they did have, I think they had a return to Tube of Horrors that was later printed. Uh, yeah, it's just as bad. Well, they had a return <laughs> to the Temple of Elders. There, there's a lot of return yeah. and some classic reprints, but I hate the Temple of Elders. So, uh, Asarak was a powerful wizard who became a lich and then later a demi lich. So he's, he's like upgraded himself and then upgraded himself again in the wrong direction if you're a good guy. <laughs> Uh, he first appears in the original Tomb of Horrors adventure in 1978. So he's been a part of the game for a very long time. Yeah, but in, in Lich years, that's just a few. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was like Puppy Dog. That was yesterday. <laughs> uh, Asarak is the son of a Baylor, a worshiper of Orcus, and the apprentice of... I use... Vecna! Oh, yeah, that's right. He's an Vecna. apprentice to Vecna? An apprentice to Vecna. Wow. Because they're both old and dead. <laughs> yeah. I still keep looking at that. And so, um, again, 
you know, for that lore to be out 78. Uh, definitely in the third season of Stranger Things, if you guys have been out there watching that, uh, they <laughs> yeah. named that the main antagonist there, Vecna. Yeah. Uh, I think that captures how scary Vecna, Asrak, those sorts of entities were in this game. I mean, they've got the power to look at you and you die. I mean, literally, they're just like, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, and that's after you've done the Tomb of Horrors to get to them, or the, the Tomb of Annihilation. If you guys have ever played Tomb of Annihilation, you got like liked. five, yeah, five characters through that stuff. Um, those, the, those, they aren't characteristic of the the game as a whole. We weren't like just grinding people in dungeons all the time, but it it does give you an idea of how easy it was to lose a character in first and second edition, particularly. Well, I mean, it's the lich's house, and he knows that adventurers are going to come in to try to kill him, so he's going to well, booby trap the place top and bottom. Even fighting, like, well, at the booby trap. No. I mean, with all the evil creatures that are taking up residence there? Yeah, they came over there for your, your 5995 yeah. course. Well, think, about yeah. It. Yeah. think about it. You just broke into their house. Yeah. They didn't say, hey, open the door for you. Come on in. You want something to eat? No. You just kicked in their door and to their house... No, it's not going to go, it doesn't go well. So, the Tomb of Horrors is long Asrak's home in Undeath. As a demi-lich, he then moves to the demi-plane of Moyle to, contem- uh, to complete his grand plans. Yeah, none of that's a good thing. No. Uh, Asrak is such a big deal that there's a shrine for him in the form of a five-foot statue of a humanoid skull uh, on the second layer of pandemonium. <laughs> He's not a plaque. It's not like an honorable mention. Well, even it's that, not, like, not like in the registry. There's a five foot statue. It's a five foot <laughs> skull. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the second layer of pandemonium. That's so weird in that box set, Planes of Chaos, you'll find pandemonium. Uh, just leave it. Okay. No, yeah, I don't know. Just leave it. Because no, you don't want to go there. But no. You're not coming back. You know, like when, when you. Like earlier, you had a gold piece and your tour guide sent you to the, the City of Skulls. When you've got a silver piece <laughs> or a copper, that's where they send you. <laughs> it's like, oh, I've got the place for it's you. Yeah, oh, it's discount vacation. Well, yeah, there's a fantastic statue you've got to see. <laughs> <laughs> Almost all of the planes of chaos have ill effects of just you arriving. Oh, yeah, they're not, not where you want to be in that setting for sure. So, um, yeah, we catch back up with him in Tomb of Annihilation where it's been moved in the, in the, from Greyhawk into Faerun. Over to the left, off of the coast, the island of Cholt. Cholt. So you'll, you'll find it been, has been placed over there. Yep. It's been moved really well. So that's a cool uh, adaptation <laughs> of the Tomb of Horrors. Mm-hmm. And if you get an opportunity to play it, uh, hopefully your DM is not <laughs> vindictive, but it's, it's pretty neat. Oh. Well, the coolest thing I think about all of that is that now we have a lich running Jurassic Park. <laughs> He's running Jurassic Park. Doesn't matter. <laughs> if the boss or after chews on it a little bit. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and then uh I guess that's one way of looking at it. One of the other things that we, we came across here, uh Dragathal. A powerful undead dragon known as a Draco Lich, that's a major one. player in Dungeons Age of Worms adventure. Uh Dragathal was formerly a powerful red dragon, the mightiest consort of Tiamat. At some point, Dragatha offended his mistress and was forced to leave Avernus. He hung out in Avernus. This is how strong the <laughs> dragon is. Right, so you play Descent into Avernus, you get down to the first, you see Tiamat guarding the stairs to the second level. Like, if you play these adventures, you know how big the deal that is. And he's just, he's one of the red dragons, the ancient red dragons, and as a consort of Tiamat, that's where he lived until she booted him out of there. Uh, Wouldn't then, get back the remote. So maybe, <laughs> uh, kept stealing the blanket. Yeah. <laughs> Making his way to Earth, Dragatha fell in with Kyus and eventually became a Dracolich and Kyus's greatest servant. Dragatha's lair is thought to lie in the worm crawl fissure near Rift Canyon. So, yeah, that's Rift Dragolich. Canyon, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just over there. Up yeah. there, it's in <laughs> Bandit Kingdoms. Yeah. So, yeah, like, do we want to go up there? Oh, there's bandits. Oh, there's a fissure to the abyss. Because that's where, he, right that's where he came yeah. from. Yeah. And then, oh, now there's a Draco lich hanging out because he can't go back in. But so that's like the Grand Canyon, so it's not a pothole you can just fill in. For sure. And, <laughs> you got a little bit of spackle and some, yeah, no. some guys out there with a bucket of... <laughs> not gonna happen. You know, and saying this again, Draco lich, bad day. Yeah. Named Draco lich, don't even bother. Yeah, because you're right. Any monster that is a 
It's it's this, but it is a named monster. Yeah. Like I like to apply that. You can apply it right down to the uh, orc. Yeah. You know, the sergeant, yeah. The sergeant of the guard and the orcs. So he's just another three hit die orc, but he's the sergeant of the guard. And it, this is Bob. And mm -hmm. so Bob's going to have a better weapon, better armor. He may even have some type of magic guy. And yeah. probably some guys that are going to be there to protect just him. Yeah. Yeah. You can probably have a funky. Yeah. Here too. Yeah. But you're, yeah, you're not wrong. It applies across the board. If they're a named monster, yeah, they got something special. One of the things I want to uh, point out here, some more Gary Gygax stuff here. Uh, Z-A-G-Y-G. It's a gig. God of humor and occult. <laughs> So there you go, Gary Gygax. We, uh, um, interestingly enough, so as uh, Gary Gygax left TSR, he did have his own um, world setting with several books, modules, adventures, and, and game system uh, for Castles of Gig and some things like that. So if you're interested in some of the the other Gygaxian uh, material, you can go find that under that name. Well, because he was really wanting to expand uh, Castle Greyhawk, and I think they got... Did they get all 50 levels out? Because I think they released no, like it, two more modules and a book or something. No, the, the one book you're thinking of was a fan project that the oh. gentleman put together. Um, that was really uh, pretty good. Um, but yeah, we got Ayuz, and at a certain point, I'll point this out. So Vecna manages to become, secure himself a place as a god as you go through the different adventures. We had Vecna lives... The Return of Vecna, Die, Die Vecna, Vecna, Die. Die. <laughs> and there was another one where he was featured, uh, like part of his plot spills over and you're like trying to tie up some loose ends. Uh, but that was his, his eventual goal. And so in this listing where I found, he's Vecna, God of Evil Secrets. Not, Not just secrets. Se yeah, so Evil Secrets. Um, knowledge and Arcana would be his 5e. Um, and his, his, uh, his symbol there is hand with an eye in the palm representing his hand and, and his eye. eye. Um, and through the timeline, after he's defeated the first time, those artifacts pop up here and there to cause uh, different bits of chaos through the... How powerful do you have to be for a part of your body to become an artifact? That is well, <laughs> powerful enough to eventually not... Like, he, he doesn't... He's not listed as a lesser. He's listed as a it's greater... A blown deity. Deity. So he, he eventually manages to make that jump. Uh, so he's quite you have, powerful. You have demigod, lesser god, greater god. Yeah. So... Uh, so you have like uh, immortal hero with yep. Hercules, then your demigod, lesser god, and even Aserac ends up with his own demi plane as a demi lich. So he's in that demigod, like immortal hero. He's he's high up as well. So Vecna, in in here. So up there we have Ayuz, the land just to the east. He's there. Yeah, just hanging out. They're good friends. Well, <laughs> they so I think that that one owes their homage to the goddess Norel. Yep. And um, Orcus also features heavily because they're all undead. Um, yep. There's there's just like a lot of bad things going on. Let's see if I can find yeah. Narelle. Oh, so yeah, Narelle is straight up the god yeah. of death. Death. Um, and then uh, Orcus is a. Uh, I guess he'd be like extra planar in in the way that this would be understood. So or, 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 yeah, he'd Orcus. be extra planar. Yeah, he's uh, because he's also a god of death. The undead. Well, he's the, his the official title for 5th edition is the Demon King of the Undead. When you get into some of his lore, he's, uh, he actually, Orcus, was in charge of one of the planes, one of the levels of hell. Yeah, yeah well, he's, he's, he's in like, charge of the first level. Right, but there's, there's some things where at one point he's uh, displaced and then has to come back. And so his titles and powers have changed hmm. through some yeah. of the, through some of the, he, the he took lore. vacation for a while. When he came back, you know, somebody had his job. Yeah, so so they didn't do a temporary hire to cover the position. <laughs> in, in some of the lore surrounding him, which is really kind of interesting when you get into Planescape and and the broader cosmology that's D and D, uh, he's got some interesting things that happen. Uh, mm -hmm. But Norel is the settings god of death, and then you'll see different mentions with around Vecna and Aserac, where they were having dealings and, and paying homage to Orcus uh, as ways to to gain even greater power through. Because that's one of the things you'll, too, you'll see too is like um, in those Ayus and the lands in the rail, um, where you have to curry favor. Uh, if you hit a roadblock, you have to go around it. If yeah. you can't go through it, and they went around, it, and then they get on top of it, and then they crush their opposition, and that's where they're at. So, um, 
that's going to be some of the the interesting uh, threats and and special monsters that you'll find yeah. as part of uh, what's going on with Greyhawk here. So, um, Troy, I want to have you talk a little bit about um, you know, playing in Greyhawk. So that's that's where I played. That's where you know when I started as a young man. Um, when yeah. I was a young war dog. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, before we get into some of these, these other, like, the classics, but um, just playing D&D, like, in the setting of Greyhawk, what were some of the things that, or particular moments that you really enjoyed about it? Oh, I'm sure a, a particular moment will come to mind, but one of the things that I, I remember early on in, in just learning to play the game, uh, when things in the world setting would come up, <laughs> and... Rick was a, the, 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 there was a couple times I played before we started playing with Rick, and Rick was very much by the book kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And when everything with the, with the world setting would come out, I remember being described like all these different movies that we'd seen. Oh, yeah. So when it was Excalibur yeah. and Lord of the Rings, you know, watching, reading it in the, in the comics, movies that had been out at that time. But there had been a few movies out. Well, it was all very fantasy. And, right. Well, that's, that's one of the things I mentioned. Um, at the time this was coming out, sword and sorcerer movies were a yes. big genre. So, oh yeah, and Red Sonia, Conan, Beastmaster, Lady Hawk, uh, that yeah. that set of films, and, and it's overlaid. Dragon Man. Well, I mean, even like the, like the early '90s uh, He-Man and Xena stuff. Maybe this that well, came well, out a little bit later, but it, but it was heavily influenced yeah. by yeah. So uh, Kevin so Sorbo, it's, it's, yeah, it's very much that that high fantasy mm -hmm. and magic being. I don't want to say rare, but sparse. Mm -hmm. uh, made magic more valuable. Because mm -hmm. you'd find a magic... And, uh, so you'd have, uh, say, five or six adventures, and you're about fifth level. Yeah. But when you get into a dungeon, you come out and you take inventory, and what all you just get, you may have three magic items. Mm -hmm. a, a ring, uh, some kind of brooch, and some other item. And you have three magic items, and there's six of you. So you're like, okay, how do you divide that up? Or is it even useful for us? Is it even useful? So then we would spend time and money trying to figure out what it is. And if it helps us, oh, this ring is a protection. A magic user who doesn't wear armor, because he can't, at that time. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and cast Lightning Bolt with a chain, uh, chain mail shirt on. Well, a, a <laughs> ring of protection that also helps with saving throws and everything. Yeah. And if it wasn't something that was useful, then we'd find a place to sell it. And so if he got the magic ring, that's his partner's treasure. Right. So and then you take the cash and everything else and you divide it amongst the three of us fighters. I can't wear any magic. <laughs> I can't do this, I can't do that. I'm just gonna sit over here and salt and count my money. Yeah, the the fighters were definitely limited in the earlier editions where uh -huh. like if you didn't basically you your magic item was a plus something. Yes. Yeah. Very rarely, um, because we didn't have many of them, we didn't have like so you'd have like the flambers, the sword of like, like the ice sword, and a vorpal sword, that, that and, hammer. And but there was there was very few you could count on one hand, kind of like magic weapons. Yeah, there was. And everything yeah. else was like, oh, I've got chainmail plus two and a warhammer plus one. Right. And it may it may be like you'd have a shield of, of reflect or something. But I tell you what, when something would happen, and you hear those words that everybody hates to hear from the DM, roll initiatives, please. Yeah. Or, or that uh, user's like, I'm standing behind him. Or what? <laughs> What's your AC? Yeah. <laughs> Can I see your character sheet? Yeah. You know, <laughs> That's the dreaded one. Oh, yeah. Hey, hey uh, pass me that. You're like, oh, man. Yeah. We we're, were playing at Haven uh, a few weeks back. Oh, yeah. The guy's like, Can I see your character sheet? Go, yeah, sure. What? <laughs> yeah, I'm not checking yeah. the number. I'm like, killing you right now. You understand you're dying. You are going to die. I had to do that with one guy because. Uh, I was like, all right, cool, I need you to save versus poison. He's like, well, I have these things that makes me immune to all these. I was like, cool, can I see your character sheet? And passes it over, and I was like, nope, says you're only immune to disease. Save versus poison. <laughs> <laughs> so well, there's, there's a lot. Of, I think it holds a special place in my heart, because when I started learning the game, it was, it was um, very hard. I think it's easier to start here, honestly, because... With Faerun having so much magic and being so, uh, like, over the top for everything, I think it makes it kind of difficult for new players to get a grasp on what's actually happening. I think, well, some of that, yes, but a lot of that can be toned down for the level and type of player. You know, a group of new players, you definitely want to break them into. 
you don't want to just start out with, uh, you know, mind flares and flaming swords. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to break them into it a little bit. I remember for the longest time, I mean, probably three levels, the only magic item in our party, the thief, it was a thief? No, the magic user had a plus one dagger. Because <laughs> all he could use was a dagger. So, that was so like, here you go, Steve. So that's all we had. Yeah. I mean, magic items, yeah. that was it. And I remember we get into a fight with some, uh, I think it was undead. I'm he's like, the, you got the magic dagger? He's the only one that can hit him. Right, right. He's like, I don't have any armor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, give your dagger to somebody else that'll go over there and stab him with. <laughs> and oh, uh, it, it's just comical stuff like that around. But with Greyhawk, some of some of my most fun came from being so uh, knowledgeable about the world setting, and then putting together very involved political campaigns for my more experienced folks. Right. Where you have to do something for this for this country because this country wants to do X and this country wants to do X. And you got to go da 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 da, and you find out all the political intrigue that's going on. Mm -hmm. And I worked this up to getting players into Planescape. I run you guys all over the place, and you're you're fighting all this weird stuff, and it's to build you up for Planescape, because you know this is going on in the Pomars, and this is going on in the Wild Coast, and this is going on in the desert, and this is going on in, the, in this, and you're like, why are we seeing this? These people don't supposed to live here, <laughs> right? But it, it's so that you can get um, first build you up in, in character level a little bit because I think it's does a player a disservice to throw them into Planescape the first level because it's just you can't make it yeah, character. I'm, I'm pretty sure a kid that grows up in Planescape is not first level. No, no it's, like, it's like Timmy's eighth birthday. He's actually a level three bard. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's kind of like probably more like Rogue, but yeah. It's kind of yeah. Where, uh, Bart Simpson was going to be a cop for a while, and, and the cop says, "Okay, well, you, you're uh, you're sixth grade in uh, elementary school, public school. Yeah. I'm going to assume that you're already fluent with small arms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. We're going to move on to a grenade launcher. He's like, cool. <laughs> yeah. Your background so, says you already yeah. know this. So, and all the kids want to shoot their grenade launcher that way, that way, and Bart shoots his that way, <laughs> and uh, he says, we missed." Did I? Maybe you blow something up over there. It blew up Skinner's car. Yeah. <laughs> Principal Skinner's car. Boom! <laughs> yeah. Nice. So, uh, growing up in, play, in in Greyhawk led me, uh, because I became very familiar with it over the years, and then I moved on to, we got some, uh, what's under the cover? Yeah. I'm, uh, I got a lot of uh, Forgotten Realms. And there's things about it that I liked and things that I didn't, because I was comparing it in, the, in my mind to Greyhawk. And then when I came across Planescape, it was like, oh, now I understand what they were talking about. Yeah, that like Spelljammer started the Wii thing. Yeah, started the Wii things Jammer. together, and they they saw where where they had success with it. And then Planescape was like, is that the door? Come on, and just knocks it wide open. Yeah, Spelljammer was so like, you get to go to other planes of existence. And he has all of the planes of existence. <laughs> in my Holy War campaign, I would run part in uh, Greyhawk. Roger would run uh, Dark Sun. Uh, uh, Scott. Uh, Scott would run Ravenloft. Mm -hmm. And you see, we had another one. I forget what it was. It was like four or five total mm -hmm. different ones. And so I would run, when you're plane jumping from one place to another, right. when you're in Greyhawk, I was running the game. When you plane jump to Ravenloft, Scott was running the game. Mm -hmm. And we had worked on the whole outline for Oh, several several Saturdays for probably two or three weeks anyway. Yeah. And we had the outline, we were going to do this and that. And I remember Scott and, and Roger, they were like, so what do we do when they plane jump to here? And I said, well, first and second level, they're going to be here. Yeah. And then second to fourth level, they're going there. He's like, okay, so how do we do it? I said, well, in your world, we have to accomplish this goal or find this information that yeah. ties together with the whole thing. And they're like, okay, so we just wrote it all as a giant outline. And I remember the, the, one of the last days we were working on it, and uh, Scott and, and, uh, and Roger both like, this is going to be great. <laughs> yeah. And like, so we can't tell even you what we're going to do as part of the adventure. And I said, no, I don't want to know. Right, because now I'm going to be a player. Right. And the first night we were playing that, and they plane jumped to Ravenloft, I just picked my books up, sent them over there, and whatever, sat down. And me and, and Scott traded places, and I set my stuff down, 
And Scott comes over, and he's sitting up behind the, the screen. Everybody else on the table is like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're just plane travel, brilliant flash of light, right? And they're like, yeah. Scott? <laughs> yeah, now, what do you see? Like, You're currently like, being eaten by a vampire <laughs> and werewolf. And you... yeah, so everybody <laughs> playing travel. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> playing travel. And here's my character. Mm -hmm. You know, it comes right out the door behind him. Everybody's like, "Who the hell are you?" I was like, "Who the hell am I? Who the hell are you?" <laughs> where's all? Where's all my guys? And like, we don't know who you're talking about. Well, we just plane traveled, and well, now you're here. Okay. Well, does that mean my guys are there? <laughs> <laughs> so when we were plane travel. Our character we were playing actually plane traveled and got lost. Yeah. And then they would have another character from, from somebody else. So when I was playing, my character was out there. And it was so much fun because the players at different times were like, what's going to happen next? I, like, I ain't got a clue. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I ain't got a clue. Yeah. I know the general outline, but that's not going to help us in this room. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so if you're playing in Greyhawk or whatever world setting that you're playing in, Remember Spelljammer, because we use Spelljammer a lot for all that traveling. Yeah. And we also use the Gypsies in Ravenloft. Mm -hmm. It took about the third or fourth trip to Ravenloft when we figured that out. <laughs> right. But you can use the Gypsies. If you pay them well, they'll take you places. Because, mm -hmm. you know, they can travel in the mist without getting injured. Yeah. And they know where they're going. So if you pay them well enough, they'll take you there. One of the things I'll say about the world of Greyhawk, particularly for those folks that are out there playing 5th edition, is that um, there's a lot of homebrewers that are out there, and uh, Greyhawk lends itself really well uh, to being modded. But, I mean, for you to use as a skeleton to then put your meat on. Yeah, so You definitely have to flesh out your adventure. Yeah, your adventure, your stories, certain um, kingdoms, governments. But... A lot of the hard work is done for you. So rather than sitting down with all your 5th edition books in front of you in a blank page trying to figure out what my world setting is, um, Greyhawk, because it's got the right detail without going and defining literally everything, um, allows you as the game master to go in and change the curtains, dress it up this way, and, and get in the, the NPCs and problems that you want to have to tell your story um, without necessarily having to do so much work on the world building front of it. I do want to point out probably the best reason why I love Swarm and Greyhawk. Mm -hmm. So in the hardback book, in the back, they have Appendix uh, Appendix 1, zero level characters. Yeah, there's... I love zero <laughs> level characters. I don't know if you can do it in 5th edition. You can, it's just so got to... It, that took a a bit of savvy and this was one of those things that was um part of the gaming community at the time yes was yeah. you know how do i get a player that maybe has played a million times and they don't they're trying to figure it out or we're introducing new players uh zero level is is not the same as session zero we're talking about you know a character that has no predefined class and thereby has no advantages disadvantages or limits they can try to do anything and everything but of course they're going to be a negative modifiers and a small percentage chance of success or anything even picking up a sword and swinging it throwing a rock to hit something yeah because literally they just left home whatever home was yeah and so they would have very few personal skills and they have to learn to do everything while on the run yeah. from orcs or goblins or whatever in, in a fifth edition context you would have your ability scores your name your backgrounds and all your personality traits, so the bonds, flaws, and so on. Yes. But you wouldn't have your class. You nope. probably wouldn't have starting equipment for much. Nope. Um, you may have a very little money. I mean, like two or three gold at the max. Yeah. And then some sort of personal heirloom is typical. Uh, you may have like a... My dad's sword or a letter from mom or, you know, any number... Maybe a Small. rusty knife that yeah. you used every day. Uh, you, you took your, your pitchfork off of the farm and cut the two tines off the end so you had a spear, it's a makeshift spear. Yeah, yeah, something very, very, very basic. But those characters, in my mind, when you make those characters <clears throat> and they survive, <laughs> right. those characters and players have a very tight bond as a group oh. and now can accomplish yeah. great things because they've known each other for years. Once, once, particularly when you have a zero-level party, 
we all have to come through that initial <coughs> set of challenges. Uh, one that we found and have ran through a lot. Um, I think it's that's the in the hold of the sea princess. In the whole sea princess, so you're you, captured you, by slavers. Yeah, you're captured by slavers and the boat wrecks. And yeah. your first problem is getting off of this boat before you drown. <laughs> because you ran aground in the storm on some rocks and it's sinking. So now you have uh, a few minutes to get off of here. So, you, so those zero level modules tend to have like a very present problem that gets the players into the issue. So if you're in a farming community, it's now under attack by bandits or, you know, some of these things that would require this group that, you know, isn't adventurers, isn't trained in Warcraft, isn't trained as mages to suddenly have a problem where they need to rise to that occasion. And through that, they're like, you know what, you know, I was able to do this or that. And I think I'm going to pursue it further. Um, but as when the group comes together to solve those initial problems without many resources, uh, they learn to rely on each other. And that does form those tight parties um, that end up being um, really cool adventuring groups. So you find people will learn skills uh, that are more survival skills, you know, building shelters, hunting, starting a fire, uh, how to make a jacket out of a canvas tarp. Right. And, and how to make a sharpened knife out of just a couple of sticks and a rock. The idea is not to stay zero level for long. Um, you know, a one eight-hour adventure, two four-hour adventures, enough to get into the problem, survive it, uh, you know, troubleshoot, and then get on to the other side of it, and then finally make a declaration as to which direction you're going. But so those... Typically, depending on your game, to go from a zero to first level, they typically will need to find somebody that they can learn, formally be taught how to swing a sword, cast a spell. Right. Uh, well, I'd, I'd say that'd be more important with magic because I think you can kind of, uh, you know, well, fake your way through swinging a sword, at least for a while. But well, still, still need to be taught. How gen to generally, you when you get out there and you make your escape from the situation, uh, you find somewhere that has those resources and infrastructure available. So you're like, all right, Steve, um, you know, you did a lot of, um, you know, you're trying to do armor, you're trying to defend some people. Um, you know, there is a, uh, a monastery with paladins. There's a, the captain, the guard over there that's training militia. You know, you might be able to direct people towards those um, infrastructure that, you know, Steve is trying, you know, or he was playing very much like a fighter character. Uh, you were trying to activate everything you might consider a uh, rogue um, or magic or anything. You, know, so you tend to, at the end of those zero level adventures, get to the point where you can, um, you know, in the story of the characters, have them start on it down those paths. Even if it's somebody that shows them a few basics, you know, a couple things with a coin or a lockpick at the bar, they're like, oh, well, now you have, you know, you've started. That's what level one is. You've started acquiring these abilities these skills you set your character on a path so this this hardback of uh greyhawk adventures uh you can get it off of either ebay or or as a reprint and uh, i highly encourage you to look at there's other character skills and there's spells as magic well items as there, there's some magic items unique yeah. to greyhawk in it, there it's the, the, the primer areas. that you need for greyhawk as a world setting. Yeah. Yeah, this well, just any set. world setting, having more magic items or more well, information no, what or I, anything. What I mean is, this book is what you would you need to. You don't need to go find the old box set necessarily. Uh, this as a reprint or PDF, or finding the the original in a game store. Yeah, this is what you would need to get started in Greyhawk. Yeah. and it, that's pretty nice. That it, it doesn't take a ton of material, and you can find the maps very easily in high resolution online. Um, Particularly if you're playing on a virtual tabletop, that's kind of nice to have. But um, Greyhawk, again, I think it's some of its strengths are that it's got the detail you need to get started. To to and it allows the space for a game master to go in, and fill in those blanks, create and dress the world as they would want to, without needing to do all of the minutia of building a world from scratch. Which we see a lot of game masters out there working on, and they do end up with some very cool uh, worlds that they've developed. The content. But, you know, oftentimes they don't recognize how big a uh, project that can be. Oh. And so this can get you playing with your stories, with your characters, with your themes uh, in a very short order with a ton of support. 
Um, so you've got a lot of adventures to pull from. You've got maps. You've got cities and things that are well defined. Um, it'll get you going. So the last thing I want to talk about here are some of the classic adventures. Such as? So, okay. Well, the two of Annihilation and... So they come, they come in and they ended up in sets, right? So I think it was four modules for Scourge of the Slave Wars. Yes. Uh, Queen of the Spiders. Yes. Uh, let's see. Desert of Desolation. Yeah. Uh, in Search of Adventure. There's a, there's a couple of things there. Uh, yeah, Mortar Canaan's Fantastic Adventure. That's a good one. Uh, the Realms of Horror, which included the Tomb of Horror. And then, of course, uh, the Temple of Elemental Evil. So there's a child's play reading uh, the well, dragon. <laughs> that is true. I forgot about that. Uh, this was some of the stuff that I was printed dragon. later in second edition. But um, these are these are the the, the large storylines set, sets of modules, right? Like I said, Scourge of the Slave Lands is four or five adventures. Um, there's quite a lot for Temple of Elemental Evil. Um, it's got the city of Homelet is the start, and then the Temple of Elemental Evil. Uh, was the second book. It's a four-layer dungeon with the temple outside and the surrounding territories. Um, one of the things that's been pretty neat is that uh, there's a conversion. So Goodman Games has been releasing a lot of these in their 5e updates. Nice. And so we've seen, like, uh, it's purple book, The Slave Fits the Undercity and all that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's all four modules and a big old book. Uh, but what's nice about what Goodman Games does is that they're very true to the original content. Uh, when they do their 5e updates. And so you'll get more than just the adventure as well. You get uh, some of their uh, notes, uh, some of the changes they've made, some appendices in the back, some interviews with some of the original authors about the material. I do and, like that. Like, if they change something, they tell you what they changed. Right. And some uh, sometimes it's not like making a change, but it's a correction. Some of the things where, you know, a bit of lore was adjusted or things were, were changed around. Um, but Goodman Games... Uh, the Temple of Elemental Evil is number six. And that comes as a as a two-book box set that's really kind of interesting. has quite a lot going on with it. Um, but they've got at least six now um, for all these classics. And Goodman Games has updated these for fifth edition. So you grab them, you, you filter them in. If you pair it with this, you've got Greyhawk, and now your Greyhawk Adventures. It's a very quick way to get some of this classic material. Very cool. Very neat stories that you don't see in uh, a lot of the other 5e games. And I've got people like uh, we talked with Nathaniel. He's on a second and planning a third run through Curse of Straw. That drives me crazy. <laughs> uh, I he, mean, he, he loves it, but at the same time as a player, you know, when you've only got so many games or you've got only so much time to commit to your hobbies, I don't want to run Curse of Straw three times. Um, even as a game master, I... I I get driven bonkers by that sort of stuff. Yeah, one of the things I encourage everybody is uh, almost all of this older material is available as either a reprint or on eBay. Oh, yeah. And I encourage you to go there and make a small investment because nobody that you're playing with today has seen it. Yeah. And you're going to just spend a few minutes uh, converting the monsters and the bad guys to your 5D stats, Mm -hmm. which a lot of times can be done on the fly. Yeah, if if it says Goblin, you pull out your monster and you go, wow, done. Yeah, so I highly encourage you to consider doing that with some of the older material. And your players are going to enjoy it because it's a story that they're playing they've never heard of. But I guarantee you, you go to the game store, everybody's played Ravenloft, everybody's played the... Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, all the, the new set of the modules. Or, so the, there's... Twilight of the Fae or something. Uh, Beyond the Witchlight. Yep. Yeah, well, Beyond the Witchlight. There's, that was everybody's a, played a popular. Mm-hmm. And then now Dragonlance, which is very good. Yeah. But yeah. they'll eventually... Uh, and let's say it continue that War of the Lance yeah. saga, it's it's going to be kind of stale. In a few months, everybody would play it. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, even then, a lot of people have already played it. For so, sure. And that's the thing that's nice about the Goodman games is that it gives you something that's already 5e that you don't have to write. Um, it's it's all right there. So the only thing you have to do is, is um, come up with your notes after you've read the material and run the game. It can save you a ton of prep time as a game master to have this pre-printed material. It's not a cop out. It doesn't reflect poorly on you as a game master. It allows you a a a way to get into the game and tell a story. It's still you telling the story. These modules 
aren't something that you literally read off the page. They give you no. uh, an idea. It's it's just like the Greyhawk stuff. It'll give you the flesh and bones, and then you kind of have to address it and experience it and, and prosecute it. Um, be sure and read it long before your game, because there may be some things that you'll have to change or tweak here and there yeah. to make it fit better in your overall story that you're doing. Maybe you, you're going to put yeah. this adventure in the middle of your campaign. So you may need to do some tweaks with locations, character names. Maybe you want to drop a, a magic treasure map yeah. here. Some things that you need to change or add to it so that it fits better in your story. One of the things that's interesting about the Temple of Elemental Evil is that if you get into the 5e campaign module, Princes of the Apocalypse, they actually, in the appendix of for Princes, reference several of the things that you'll find in the Temple of Elemental Evil. So there are four stones that are aspected for each of the four. Yeah, you know now. Here he goes. So, yeah, the four stones aspected to one of the four elements uh, feature heavily as some of the things that are happening with Princes of the Apocalypse. So it, um, you can take a low-level adventure party through Temple of Elemental Evil. No, you can't. Well, okay, it, it's it actually I think the elemental evil is like thirteen. So how much? Well, as long as you hire the tour guide, I think you can. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the idea is, even this old material has um, inspired a lot of the newer stuff, and so you oh, can yeah. grab Temple of Elemental Evil, work your party through that, some of it side, and build them mm -hmm. up, and then get into Princes of the Apocalypse and play the whole storyline. Uh, just, I think, what is it, Descent into Avernus after that, there's a fall. Yeah. So there's a lot of material you can get, play, weave your story, adjust, and build yeah. on. But there uh, will be saves... some adjusting in between those to make them yeah. fit. And the cool thing about the Goodman Games conversions is they provide you all the notes about, hey, uh, we left all the monsters as they were originally found, so you may have to make adjustments, and we recommend these adjustments in this way, based on party type, mix, and skills and abilities. Uh, sure. So they've done a lot of that whole legwork for you. And you just have to decide how to use it. But it's cool. You can take this material, and and it doesn't even have to be set in Greyhawk. You can stay in Faerun if you want to. Or, because it's, you're dealing with cosmological problems at that point, you start to plane travel or jump on a spell jammer. And now you're over here and dealing with the Princes of the Apocalypse yeah. as it was written for 5e in Faerun and this or that. So, um, when we played uh, back, in, back in the day... <laughs> Uh, we went through it twice, still don't not complete it. Both times we were carrying bodies out. And we were, we were thinking about going back the third time and we voted no. Yeah. Uh, but it was, it was cool. We never completed it. Been in it twice. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And, um, and the mirror is not a mirror. I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah, don't do that. Don't uh, do that. It's, <laughs> it's bad. Uh, so we had yeah, the Village of Hamlet, the Temple of Elemental Evil, the Return to the Temple of Elemental Evil. Yeah, let's go back. Yeah. That's such a great place. First time, this is a great plan. Well, there was a, it was a full return series. So we had Elemental Evil, the uh, Temple Horrors. Yeah. Let's go back to mess with Aserac. Like, no, no. Well, no, see, what happened is that you killed them the first time, and then somebody told the adventuring the party about a phylactery, and they're like, well, damn, now we have to go back there to make sure he's actually yeah. dead. <laughs> so there was White Plume Mountain, Return to White Plume Mountain. Yeah. Um, a lot of these classic adventures are really... Um, set forward storylines that were, were big storylines that influenced a lot of the other things we got. So what we didn't see as, as many novels, like definitely novels in Dragonlance and Forgotten Realms were hugely influential on the realms and Dragonlance. We didn't see as many novels for Greyhawk, but we had a ton of modules or in-world stories that fleshed out, developed the world, and then, and that sort of storytelling and development further influenced Forgotten Realms, Dragonlance, and the other D&D properties that were out there. Um, so, you know, particularly when you're, if you're going to jump into Greyhawk, you can jump into some of these old modules, these, these storylines. The uh, Scourge of the Slave uh, Lands oh, yeah. is one where, you know, definitely if you want to be heroes fighting against evil, I don't think you can find anything more blatantly evil than slavery. Yeah. And so in this way, you can definitely stand up for what's right and and you know free a lot of people disrupt that slave trade and it's a it's a long four module series so it's got quite a lot of content to play um queen of the spiders is quite an interesting one and if you like drow <laughs> and by interesting one i mean you're probably going to get eaten by spiders what do you mean like drow well so drizzit oh yeah yes yeah. and so there's there's a 
particularly in Faerun, and where you can also play a rather a third edition that had a lot of uh, drow content. So we get second edition Menzo Bronze on the Book of Drow and yeah. the Underdark. Yeah, that was fleshed out over there. So it, if you're interested in those stories and and the lore and the culture, um, Queen of the Spiders was some really early Drow stuff. Um, yeah, they're not very common. Like we mentioned earlier in Greyhawk, they're thought to almost not exist in Greyhawk. Um, and Spelljammer has a little bit more Drow in it for Grey Space as well. They're hanging out on one of the planets, so just hanging out. Yep. <laughs> well, there's, there's an asteroid field between them and us, so. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> They're keeping on that side of the fence. So that's sort of all I've got for um, Greyhawk outside of, you know, a classic world setting that was there at the beginning, developed alongside Dungeons and Dragons, that gives you as much as you need, but not too much, to play Dungeons and Dragons. With well, some of the classic storylines, characters, and things that influence the game that we know today. Well, not only that, but if you are looking for too much material, there is, in fact, too much material. There's like 90-something books and modules in its entirety printed. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of uh, uh, novels that have been done as well from Greyhound. Yeah, there's about so 20, them, module, or yeah. 20 novels. Uh, not as many as Forgotten Realms. Well, no, there's over in like 100 and something. 190 for Dragonlance. Yeah. <laughs> Dragonlance, that's what I'm Yeah. yeah. Forgotten Realms was Because I think, I think Greyhawk was in like the, the mid to low 90s. No, well, so you're talking then, about also 79... Because of like for, the, the books set, and modules, everything together. Material like and the modules. Yeah, it was like 90 something together. 79. Yeah. 79. I'm going. Yeah. Now, so maybe it, it was favorite that was in the 90s. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, if you're talking about just the stuff Salvatore wrote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, it gets quite a lot. And, and those world settings are definitely more popular in the fictions. But um, again, Greyhawk was a world that you lived in and you experienced it through. Well, I mean, stories. that's what I'm saying. Is like you can go and get those stories to continue to experience it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of great information, like I mentioned, guys out there for uh, 5e conversions. Um, there's a lot of old school gamers, first and second edition DMs that are still playing in old Greyhawk, that are still playing in old Forgotten Realms. And, uh, you know, within the community, you're always welcome to ask questions. If you haven't signed up yet, join us on our Discord, and uh, you can touch base with us there on Greyhawk, Forgotten Realms, and anything D and D, um, and of course a lot of the other TTRPGs that we all love and play. And um, you, you know, know. I think about it. When, when I ran that game in Haven, I spent probably 15 minutes explaining to the players the difference between Forgotten Realms and Greyhawk. Right. They. they They've only played 5th edition, so that's all they've mm -hmm. been ever exposed to mm -hmm. was stuff in Forgotten Realms, which is fine. I said, hey, I want to run this in, in Greyhawk. I'm like, what's that? Mm -hmm. So I yeah. spent a few minutes explaining it to them. Because there's the Greyhawk and a little bit of Ravenloft, and that's it for 5th edition. Right. Or well, Faerun. Just, just some, yeah, so it's all Faerun. Yeah. We got some, uh, it's all Faerun and, and a little of, bit of yeah. Ravenloft. That's it. But so explain some of the things to them, mm -hmm. and uh, when we got into it, and how, how things were a little different with the basic monsters. But I just found that very, as an old guy, I was crushed <laughs> because it's one of the things I like to, the new generation is playing, is I think uh, Wizard of the Coast is doing all of you a tremendous, tremendous disservice mm -hmm. by not reprinting this material. Because there are just truckloads There's of stuff. so much. Truckloads. When... when... Wizards of the Coast took over TSR in 98. They saw that modules weren't huge sellers. Not what they were, were hoping it would be. So this was where we got the OGL, and they sort of offloaded that to other like third-party independents. Mm -hmm. And now we see Cobalt Press and Goodman Games and other companies like that explode with yeah. fantastic reprints, reproductions, conversions, their own material. Yeah. And we had a little while ago where Wizards of the Coast had that well, leak we got to get Yes, and, you guys and, make it too much money. And now they sort of regret that. Um, but they still own the IPs, and so I would love to see an expansion of Dragonlands for the rest of the War of the Land. Absolutely. I would love to see Greyhawk get an official treatment. Absolutely. And I'm really looking forward to Planescape. We're going to get a three-book set, and I'm hoping that they plan further because there's two there's, milk crates. Where it's, there's so yeah. much. Like, Planescape is complex. Planescape encompasses everything. So, and it's one of the coolest settings to ever come into any sort of fantasy. Yeah. Well, like the Spelljammer set that we got wasn't enough for Spelljammer. Yeah. So if we get a Spelljammer set for Planescape, I, I would love to see. Yeah, it's but, not going to be nearly enough. So here's what they could do: they could release Greyhawk, 
You listen to Wizards of the Coast? Yeah, at least Great Hawk has a three box set like they did with Spelljammer. Okay, I'd be well, totally cool with that. But, but then that then give me another supplemental book for Spelljammer. Because now I have Ravenloft, Forgotten Realms, Dragonlance, and Greyhawk. Yeah, that and, you can all travel by to. Me. So give me another book. Let's right. expand a little bit in Spelljammer, because that is a cool yeah. setting. I really like Spelljammer. I think there needs to be one, if not two, of Spelljammer. Just more. Yeah, so, well, so we can bring on Spelljammer. And then, as we're going to get the initial drop for Planescape here in October, I'm hoping to see additional content, because there's so many cool storylines that take place. Want- just in the cosmology of but not yeah. not even you know when that starts to spill over into Greyhawk, Forgotten yeah. Realms, and oh my god, it well, does some weird things to Ravenloft. Well I mean <laughs> there's, 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 there's some crazy things that just happen inside like um the the plane where all the other planes are at before you even get to the other planes. Yeah, yeah, for sure, because you're you're on the Astral Sea in fifth yeah. edition instead of the Phlogiston. Well and I, so I mean, like the city of Sigil. Well, City of Signal that itself, yeah, but like there's all kinds of stuff there that, before you go anywhere else. For sure, and and just like City of Signal needs a book by itself. It's yeah. I well, mean it has a book on itself in there. But, there's more than one, but yes. <laughs> um, and so so I'm I'm several maps. I'm really hoping to see some of this content expand, just so that you know as a game master I have the ability to share some of these older content as what we're doing through the realms, yeah. but to then bring out these epic big games that I remember playing in and, and have fun with a new generation of player and as we continue to help game masters develop their skills and build their games um, it's always nice to show them what their options are to draw inspiration from and build oh, their yeah. worlds and go out oh, yeah. and have their stories with their friends and adventures so that's what I'm, I'm hopeful to see and I uh, would really like to have Greyhawk get an official 5e release um, just because we haven't seen like the last official thing we had with it was an adventure module in 4e. I wonder. And that's about it. Just me thinking out loud here. Yeah. Everything that we've seen released now for fifth edition has been in one version or another, location or another, and forgotten realms. So for, I wonder part. if they think, and them, yeah. Wizard of the Coast, before they release Greyhawk, they want to do it the same way they're doing Forgotten Realms, where they have adventures. That take place in Forgotten Realms have adventures that take place in Greyhawk. Well, that's probably what they're going to do because they well, keep releasing modules, but they're still going to need like the adventures book. They're still going to need you know information and stuff you know, on. They don't have any of that from Forgotten Realms. They do. They don't have a world setting book. Uh, no, no, no. But they do have the adventures book and the Sword Coast Adventures guide fleshes out some of the the spots that are not hit in the the core materials. Yes. Right. So they're going to have to do something like that. Yeah. That. For Greyhawk, mm-hmm. for sure, and that's gonna, that's where I'm hoping to see like at least a really nice thick book, if not a three box. Get oh yeah, box for Greyhawk. See, like cool. Greyhawk would be fine as a three box set. I would be totally cool with that. You know, give me one of these, nice and big, that has all the information that you need for Greyhawk. Give me one that's an adventures, and then give me one that's like a map set or something. You know? Yeah, or even like like some of the the specific monsters where we get into. Oh yeah, Edna, monster name would be and cool. Asrak mm-hmm. and the Draco Lich and. Some of those things are going to be very specific because um, even, you know, the flavor of goblins and orcs are different in Greyhawk as compared to Forgotten Realms. Yeah. You know, um, the flavor? You mean like, well, the green ones taste different one? than the gold ones. Yeah, there's like a, <laughs> it's not really great, but you know how it tastes purple if you have purple drink and then I got Kool-Aid. And there's like three colors of red that they're supposed to, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> most certainly not Kool-Aid, but it is purple. Help. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Greyhawk, very cool. Hope you guys, um, if you haven't seen it, you get a chance to check it out. And as always, if you see us out live, you can uh, grab some of our books. We always bring them with us so that you can take a look at them. Join us on Discord and uh, touch base with us there regarding any of your gaming needs. And then, Troy, let them know where else they can find us. So you can find us at our .com, Facebook, Twitch, Discord, and YouTube. Mm-hmm. So join us again uh, next month for our next show on uh, just on Twitch, yeah. Yeah, on Discord, <laughs> YouTube. YouTube. I'm gonna go take a nap. <laughs> so it's gonna be on Twitch, and then we play it again later on YouTube. But we can do this one here. Yeah. Keep an eye on this the calendar. We got a few things that we're gonna be making adjustments for as we uh, continue to work with local conventions. We've got a couple of responsibilities we've added on for uh, Vision Con coming Con in, in October. October in Springfield, Missouri. So. Um, we just got done with Tremendicon. It was it was awesome. Tremendous. It was awesome. How did you miss that? <laughs> it was tremendous. <laughs> so, 
Um, anyway, I'm Jester Boris. This has been Through the Realms. Greyhawk joining me today. The destroyed Planescape guy. Still Mr. Producer, still with the body. I'll get him later. No, you won't. <laughs> so, bye, guys. I'm going to Zoidberg away. We'll see you on the next one.